Well, the time trial stage today uh, will take these riders 46.4 uh, kilometres along a very flat course indeed, and uh, there's not much wind about either. They, they go out with a bit of a draft behind them, and then they turn around. You can see here on this little zigzag course heading back in towards the finish. They begin to move into the uh, slight drifting wind, but that's not going to be the big problem today. It's the heat. It's getting warmer all the time. Uh, it's uh, around about 26 degrees now, moving up to 28. It might even go over the top of that, so that's going to be the thing as far as the riders are concerned the heat on this 46.4 kilometre uh, circuit around it back into Salmanca. Uh, welcome then to our coverage today. This is stage six of the Tour of Spain. We're out here with Malcolm Mario out on the road. And this man is a tremendous time trialist. He's been a past winner of the, uh, the Tour of Spain. He won it in 1991. And if I can just dig back quickly into my records here, uh, last year in the time trials, he was also going quite quickly too. And I'm looking at the one now of, uh, of stage stage nine when we had the first time trial in the race last year and that went over a distance of uh, some 39.5 kilometers. Olano who starts last today was the winner of that time trial but Melka Maori who's on your screen here was in second spot just 41.2 seconds behind him. Uh, so there could be quite an interesting battle between people who are not uh, on the general classification likely to uh, be up there in the top 10 or top 20 by the time we get into Madrid at the end of this race in just over two weeks' time, two weeks come this Sunday, but people who just want to win a race like this. And I think Malcolm Mari might be the one to try and take the, the, the lead, which is held at the moment by uh, young Casey of the US Postal team. His time is 56 minutes and 59 seconds. And we go back up into the start house for uh, Peña for Vitalicia Siguros to go underway. There he goes. So just again, reminding you of the best time so far that we've had on the route. No, well, this is the overall classification, so the producers popped it up quite nice and early in the, the programme for you. Those of you Friday afternoon back in Great Britain, probably skiving off from work. What time is it back there? Half past one, I suppose, having an early lunch or something. That shows you the position that uh, Alano, after yesterday's phenomenal and tremendous stage, is now the man who everybody's looking at for this particular race. I'm not quite so sure. Alano showed enormous courage, enormous strength. He's lost a bit of weight. He was sprinting yesterday for the time bonuses. But uh, for my money, we will be able to give you a better idea of what's going to happen, not only after this time trial, but uh, the day after tomorrow with the big climb. This is the man who lost out yesterday. He took an awful pasting. Alex Zuller now is six minutes and three seconds down on general classification as he goes away. The crowd here applauding him. And he said uh, after yesterday's stage, when he really got pasted, and just blown out the back. That was the second uh, of his bad days in any of the big tours. He had two bad days. He didn't name the other one, but I think I know what it was. It was in a tour of Italy, must have been what, not last year, the year before, when I remember him uh, riding up a mountain and about, I think about three, four days in the finish, and he was really looking for a success in that one, and he blew in a mighty gasket, and he went straight back out of the league group and groveled from then on in. And of course, uh, he was one of those riders that with all the problems we had last year in the Tour de France who had to go and serve a suspension, didn't come back until May this year, so he's a bit short on racing miles, or racing kilometres, the case may be, as you go there. Well, that's the position. Casey's still in the lead, 56-59 for US Postal. Ekimov into second spot at two seconds, and that's not surprising because Ekimov, a great uh, pursuiter, is now at two seconds, but that will change later on as Guidi gets underway. Avisa Guidi, a good sprinter, has in the past been up there wearing the uh, sprinter's jersey in the uh, Tour of Spain. That's the chap who's been able to get up there in the finishing burst. Haven't seen quite so much of him uh, in the sprints this year around. We may see him later on as the race goes further up course. And by the way, looking at Pulte here, a bit of a, I say scandal, a bit of news or inverted commas what might be a problem as the heat haze here uh, just gives you some idea of how hot it is. The Pulte team have entered into a contract with Jerome Blalevens as we go back out with Malcolm Maori. Let me finish the story. I can't always get out, can I, before they change the pictures, but let's stay with the Pulte story. Jerome Blalevens riding in this race for the TVM Farm Freak team, uh, and next year it's going to be called Farm Freak, he is said to have signed a contract or be in negotiations with, and they want uh, him to move to Pulte next year, which would make an interesting combination. He, Guidi, and Blylevans could really rip things to pieces. Uh, but the uh, 
TVM Farm Freaks. In fact, next year it's going to be called Farm Freaks as TVM uh, don't go on with the with the sponsor of the team. They're saying we're going to hold you to your contract. You've still got a year to go. So the lawyers now are licking their lips and uh, reaching for their latest statement, their bank balances. <laughs> you know what lawyers are, you don't get it for cheap, do you? But anyway, it looks like it might go into the hands of the lawyers as Blalovin tries to move to the Pulte team. We're back then out here with Malcolm Murray, the winner of this race, I said, way back in 1991, some eight years ago, and a superb time trial is too. Sitting there with that enormous seat pin, now, a lot of people switch on to cycling and don't... Well, we'll come back to him in a minute. I'll, I'll give him a, a bit of chat about him and his bike later on as we go back up into the start house. And this is Bettini. Ready to go. And off he goes. Well, I don't think you'll see him burying himself on this race round the 46 kilometres on the outskirts of... Uh, Salamanca, he's going to just, I think, ride himself at a, a reasonable pace. He's Bartoli's right-hand man in the races when they're racing together, but of course Bartoli having smashed his knee when it, it came down the crash and got all stuck in somebody's front wheel or back wheel, is now really out of contention for the rest of the season. So Bertini now transferred his ability to lead people out and drive and uh, shepherd his man forward in the main big bunches when they're going in throughout the big races uh, has now had to sort of start riding for other riders but uh, Bertini is the very close mate uh, Bartoli and now he's just out there riding for the Mappe's interest in Mr Tonkov now this is the fellow Alex Zuller who I said yesterday died a thousand deaths and he really took a pasting and now as he goes thundering on here and you people back at home have been rabbiting on for the last uh, I don't know, 12 months if not 18 months about bicycle design development will probably be sick as pigs when I'm going to start talking again about this particular sword bicycle on which Alex Zuller is riding. I see nothing wrong in it. Like it's a superb piece of uh, design development. It's made of special carbon fibres. Mr Pinarello's done a wonderful job. It's the same sort of frame that was used by uh, uh, Indrain to uh, break the hour record. And you can see all this, this lovely uh, sculpturing and I think that's great, isn't it? It's lovely. Can't ride it next year. The UCI banned him because they say you have to go to a triangulated frame and the triangulations of the frame are also restricted in the difference between the the the, the width of the uh, of the, the, the frame the, the, that's the depth of frame and the width of it so in this case you see if we go alongside him oh he's gone up now he's got an enormous a deep down tube uh, but and a very thin one across he has to be three to one in the future we're right, back up then to the start house and there he goes to Adjusto. Well, he was here of the, the breakaway uh, the other day when ripped the whole thing to pieces with uh, uh, Brochard. That was yesterday. They went off down the road. And because he went off down the road, the lad from the Anse team, there was, a, there was an enormous battle took place yesterday. And I expect some of you will have seen it on, on Eurosport. But uh, the, the Benessos and the Anse team set about destroying each other yesterday. And one of the, the greatest uh, uh, casualties of that day was Alex Zuller, who suddenly just couldn't hold the pace and got blown out. And on what was quite a fairly short day by, or short stage by their normal wrecking, just uh, 160 kilometres, 100 uh, miles in all, uh, made a tremendous difference to the overall situation with Zula now being blown out of it. but this team here in the black and yellow they knew what they had to do they went out there to smash apart uh, the, the Bonesto team and they managed it uh, Laurent Jalabé on his screen here well Laurent uh, uh, at the moment lucky well, he says he's second there at uh, that particular point Laurent Jalabé is just questioning whether he might go on after Sunday we've got that big mountain stage on Sunday it depends how he goes on that stage and in fact many other riders will be just hoping they can survive that day it's going back now, fourth, Frank Franco. That Laurent Jalabert, because of his uh, big crash in the, the Tour of Castilla de Leon, is uh, just questioning how his form will be to go right the way through to Madrid. And it's no sense merging yourself if you are not up there. He's the world's number one. He's the points he scored over this uh, this season have uh, enabled him to keep on to that number one position. But uh, his form, not as he would like it. If we go back up with Malcolm Maury on this time trial, Salamanca, Salamanca, stage six, 46.4 kilometres. With Alex Zuller on the road and this remarkable sword uh, bicycle, which I said, because the, you see how thick the down tube is, it's outside the three to one limit for the UCI next year, and it doesn't have a top tube either, so goodbye. Uh, they're allowing some of the curves back in, by the way. The UCI said that they weren't going to have curves on bicycles 
for some unknown reason in, in the tubing, but I think that's coming back as our ability to have sloping top tubes within certain limits as well. So things are changing, but for my money, I wish we could still see bikes like this. It doesn't make that much difference. It, it's also psychological to many riders, and the psychology will still go on when they come along and look at the equipment they've got, and we can't stop developing, in my opinion. This is all, I think, which adds to... If, if, we, if we stopped it, like with the tennis, we might have people still play with wooden rackets, I suppose. But here we are. Bicycle development is altered. Uh, now then, if you think this bloke, as he's gone now, is all off your screen, has a chance to uh, win the time trial today, if you phone in, as you can see there, uh, on 0906 614 you can actually uh, try and see today who's going to be the, the victor overall of this stage. And now, um, the, the, the li limit uh, last... Uh, time on the Tour de France, I think it was half past four in the afternoon. I haven't got the, de the time when we actually close the voting, but I should get on pretty quick if I were you. And uh, because it's time trial, it's not that difficult to pick uh, anybody out of the top three. As the, what you'll see on your screen now uh, will be the um, the, the early starters who won't have a catch chance in except probably Maori and uh, and Zula are being up in the top half dozen. But you can not only send it through by uh, by phone, but also on the www.eurosport.com uh, you can vote as well for the victor today. Would you like me now, as we see Marco Maori going around, to give you you know the inside line? <laughs> This is the kiss of death, by the way. Uh, if you're watching cycle racing for the first time on a Friday afternoon and don't know much about what's going on, this is the time trial. We call it the race of truth because there's nowhere to shelter, nowhere to hide in... Uh Oh, the three chaps here. Oh, this is Hamilton. Now, this is a fellow, by the way. Watch out, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, if you're going to vote, uh, Hamilton might be one. He'll, I think he'll certainly make the top uh, half dozen if he, if he goes as well as I think he can do because Hamilton rocked the socks off everybody in the Tour de France the year before this in the time trial stage uh, in the, what the first time trial it was when he finished second overall and a very undulating uh, circuit it was and uh, he's just as likely I think to topple a few people out of the overall now he finished third by the way did John Hamilton in the time trial uh, 57 kilometres on the stage 19 of the Tour de France when Armstrong won that one on that 19th time trial stage that was down there at uh, Futuroscope Lance Armstrong won the time trial stage this man on your screen now uh, Zula was at nine seconds, which just shows you what a good time trial he is anyway, providing he's fit. Depends if he recovered from his thraping yesterday, because he really was awful yesterday, had a right gravel day. Uh, he was second in the Tour de France time trial stage 19, Futuroscope, uh, by nine seconds. And young Hamilton, we just spotted down the road there, was in third spot. But mind you, he was one minute, 35 seconds down. So Hamilton was a bit off the pace, but still he was there. If we go back to stage eight of the uh, Tour de France, where we had the time trial at Metz, when Lance Armstrong won that over 56.5 kilometers. This man on your screen now, Zula, was uh, second at 58 seconds. Uh, so Zula normally uh, would be in with a shout to win this time trial, providing he's recovered from yesterday. Zola went on, of course, in the Tour de France to finish in second spot overall. He also rode the Tour of Italy this year and got round, I think, uh, about at least 50% the way round. Uh, I think he survived until he finally climbed up because he hadn't been racing until the end of May because of the problems last year, which had him suspended for a bit. But nevertheless, uh, Zola rode quite well in the Tour of Italy on um, stage eight, for instance, in one of the mountainous section, then Pantani won, Jimenez was second, Zilla was into third spot. So he's beginning to show uh, that he was coming back into form. And uh, had it not been for the disaster yesterday, I'd have put Zilla up there with a chance of winning the time trial today. But uh, as you have a chance to phone in later on, if I suggest to you, and I, I don't know what time we're supposed to be finishing the voting, perhaps somebody will tell me in the break, I'll try and find out for you when you're supposed, supposed to finish the voting. I'd wait to see what Hamilton and Zilla do and then begin to think about that as a benchmark for the later start. Bobby Jurek here, by the way, won't do much today in this time trial. Uh, he's a bit down on the pace on the overall classification. He's uh, uh, still recovering from that crash that he had in the time trial at Metz. You may remember when we had it on Eurosport, Bobby Julik just went crazy. He was determined to do better than his third place in 1997 in the Tour de France and ripped round the Metz, Metz uh, time trial and disappeared in the ditch, busted his ribs and made himself very sore and hurtful indeed. And so Bobby Julik uh, didn't uh, finish yeah. the, the, uh, the time trial at Metz, nor did he finish the, the Tour de France. And he took, again, a bit of a pasting yesterday than all those riders that found themselves grovelling off the back. So I think he lost over 15 minutes yesterday. 
next ride ago. Let me just put you exactly where he was yesterday. Um, yes, Bobby Jewell came in 15 minutes and 16 seconds down with uh, Tyler Hamilton, 15 minutes, 16 seconds down. Also off the pace yesterday, uh, Vladimir Belly, as we watch even off here from the uh, TVM Farm Fritz team go down the road. Um, uh, they, he, he came in 15, 16 down as well, Belly. Uh, Nicholas Jalabert and Laurence Jalabert, both of them came in over a quarter an hour down yesterday, 15 minutes and 16 seconds. And guess who brought in the bus? You know, when you have the big group of riders who got shot off the back early on, well, they came in this great big bus of riders. There were, what, about uh, 90 of them in that, well, in fact, to be more precise, 87 of them in the bus, this group of riders that trot along, make sure they stay inside the time limit. And they got through 22 minutes and 38 seconds uh, behind the leader. And that's over 100 miles. You imagine how fast they went the leaders on the, on the day and leading in this great group of riders in what we all call the bus when all the sprinters were in there just hanging on for grim death to make sure they stayed inside the uh, the time limit the man who won the sprint from the bus yes Marcel Wust so he got a bit of honour on the day finished 87 but he's 22 minutes and 38 seconds down I tell you also that uh, Mr Malcolm Mowry was a man we've got to watch out for because Malcolm Mowry here on your screen great time trialist and he's already now sucked him, the man who started up there in front of him, so he's now going past him and looking good. Absolute out and out ex experts uh, being able to calculate and to understand their physical body and to ride themselves almost like machines against the watch. And it is something that some of the uh, mountain climbers, especially mountain climbers, just hate coming into a time trial. They've got to ride on their own. They've got to spend thick end of an hour, maybe 45, 50 minutes, exposed to the view of the general public. May even be more than that on the longer stages. And there's just no mountains to climb. And you're settling in. You've got to be concentrated all the time. And uh, you're not to do what this man's doing here. By the way, young lads here knocking the afternoon off school and watching bike racing on Eurosport, then this is what you, you can't do in time trialling. The lad from Liquid Gas in the black and green on the right-hand side here, he should pull further over. If he wants to stay near Murray, he must move across the other side of the road because he's staying a bit too close uh, to, his, to his man in front. This also um, is um, annoying to the man in front. And there's loads of time trials watching this program, I suspect, uh, who have been in the similar situation. There's nothing worse. You go past somebody, you see him in the distance, you get him, you go past, you're concentrating, working at what you've got to do, like, like uh, uh, Zula's doing here, just getting yourself concentrated, getting the rhythm going, getting the rhythm going, working hard, making sure you're in the right gear, making sure you're feeling good, doing what he's doing here, concentrating up on your speed, looking down at your, 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 your checkpoints, and then suddenly the bloke you caught comes pow up alongside you, and then he comes maybe sometimes past you, and you settle back down, and, blah, 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 and psh, he comes back up to you again. And it takes, I don't know, an awful long time, and then you get rid of him because having caught him for one, two, three, four, five minutes, whatever it is, the, the, the point is that the bloke probably isn't very good at time trial, and he needs somebody to have a target for. And there's nothing worse than time trial, and you've got somebody hovering around about you when you're concentrating and trying to do the job you've got to do. That's exactly what Zula's doing now, exactly what all the rest of the field are doing, and the, the interference of people who are not great time trialists is a bit annoying. Anyway, Garcia you out underway, as uh, we have still got uh, the top men to come, and don't forget there's a competition for you to uh, guess who's going to be the winner of the stage today, and I think it's like to come out from people like uh, Alano, uh, people like uh, uh, Zulip, if he's come back into form, people like Hamilton, people like, uh, uh, well, even Mr Ulrich. Just think about that. Jan Ulrich, winner yesterday of the stage, now only 10 seconds down on Alano, he might well catch a few people napping today. Trial stage of the Tour of Spain, 46.4 kilometres, that's stage six of the race, and you can see a bit tricky, not your average drag strip that you get in, uh, in Great Britain. In fact, I'm very pleased to see that the uh, Road Time Trial Council, the RTTC in Great Britain and the BCF have started to put on time trials that aren't uh, drag strips out and back. They take you around some little country lanes and so on, and I think that's what we have to do because that's where time trialling is if you come up to this sort of level as uh, Kimmy Levy gets underway. One of the Lotus uh, Festina riders setting off at uh, 14.54 if you're setting your watch in Central European time. That's going to be 13.54 back in the UK. Next to go Loka, Falazin, Michele, Luxemburger, Perez, uh, Nardello. And then we start to move towards the heavy gang 
but uh, at the moment in terms of the overall competition after yesterday's stage we've just got a group of riders uh, who are within 1 minute 23 seconds of the overall leader uh, Alano because after yesterday's stage they've just got blown apart the seams and down to 23rd to position over on general classification Daniel Atienza of the Polti team the Spanish rider is at 1 minute 23 on general classification and between Atienza and Abra Milano, who's going to be last off wearing the gold jersey overall race leader we've got these 23 riders uh, crammed in there uh, Ribeiro here on your screen well he'll be having to do what he has to do for his team position on the uh, team classification but again he's a very good specialist mountain climber and that's where he'll come into his own later on and he'll get his, his way out the pace we won't really have to, any concern about the overall uh, general classification until we get those final 23 riders but nevertheless these chaps out here doing what they can for the team award and if only Mr Zulli here can uh, get himself back together again he now catches his, his man in front, two minutes straight past him, gone. Then, so as far as Zula's concerned, he's got to get some salvage, something out of the uh, uh, the Tour of Spain. And I think time trialling is where he's now trying, going to try and do. He's just caught uh, his man for, for one minute. That's uh, Victor Hugo Piña, who's not a bad time trialist either, but you can see from his left knee, he's also somebody else has been suffering from the condition we've had. No, this is only stage uh, six of the Tour of Spain. And already we've been losing riders left, right and centre. And we're down now to 173 of the 189 starters in this race. Well, coming back out to the field with Marcus the Bird coming through from Rabobank. And still... There's little battle going on. It shouldn't be like this. And Malcolm Harry has got this man hovering on his back wheel. And he's been doing this for an awful long time. Now, I don't think he's going to like that at all, but uh, we'll wait to what the judges say after this is over and done with. Because the rider from the liquid gas team, I suppose, unless he was waiting for Mr. Maury to come up to him, uh, Mr. Christian Moreni is going to find his lips brisk being slapped. And if I was Mr. Maury, I'd, I'd just sit up and tell you what I think about him. Maori, by the way, is the one in the black and red on the right-hand side. Uh, and riding for Benfica. Now, uh, I don't know if I'm going to pick it up, but the Benfican riders have been wearing um, a black armband on their jersey. Difficult to pick it up because they're in the, the, the red and black colours here. Uh, and it's because it's a Portuguese team, as you, as you know, particularly football fans understand these things. Uh, Benfica who sponsored this particular team. Evidently, East Timor used to be many years ago uh, part of uh, one of the Portuguese colonies. And of course, we all know that East Timor, there's been all sorts of uh, horrendous things going on as they're trying to find some form of independence and get themselves sorted. And they've been really uh, having great, great problems in recent years. And I'm not a politician, and I don't want to get into the rights and wrongs of what's happening out there with the elections just being held recently and things that are going on. But East Timor was one time a Portuguese colony, and this Benfica team have decided, because of what's the problems out there now, uh, they're riding around with black armbands in memory of the people that lost their lives recently in East Timor. So that's what they're doing. If you spot the black armband, that's the reason why. So Fallows in underway for the Mape Quick Step team. Again, this well-drilled team looking good as regards uh, the overall classification because they've got uh, Pavel Tonkov up in the, the top echelon. He's at 47 seconds overall. Tonkov is 12th on general classification. So he made it yesterday. He's one of those riders that managed to uh, stay with all the onslaughts that we had during the day. And back out with Zola. So one of the big losers yesterday. This is not your average drag strip, is by any means. So imagine that Mr. Casey's gone around in 56 minutes and 59 seconds, and it's 46.4 kilometres. And that just gives you some idea of the quality of these riders to perform time trials over these conditions, these sort of roads, and of course this, this heat too. Back out with a better. Ah, it's down, down the left-hand side of the front wheel. It's that little black, that little device hanging down, right? There it is, that little reddish chip. Uh, I've had a... In fact, I mentioned it myself earlier on uh, about the, the chip. There are two things you see on bicycles. Sometimes there's a device that is picking up the uh, flicks of the wheel so the rider can have his own computer just showing how fast he's going, how far he's travelled, 
what time of day did he want? The average speed so far. Um, all those things come up on, on the computer, on the handlebars. <laughs> it's like a mass start, isn't it? Maori's now reeled in the man who started another, what, two minutes in front of him, so he's now pulled him back as well. So he's, he's got really bit, look, to, to turning up into a road race. The judges won't like this, but he, he's now caught up with uh, Vichario of the Fulavada team, but I don't think he'll stay very long, uh, Juan Carlos uh, uh, Vichario. He's going to get blown out a bit quick, pretty quickly. And that's your overall position still then, with uh, Casey leading. We're going back out to Rivera. So please forgive me if I overrun and start to say something and we chop up and come back again because I try and put you in the picture about things you're seeing on the screen when I, I go off and try and talk about something else and I get sort of caught out in mid-air. And, uh, and again, it's not always easy to get the flow going, but I'm doing the best I can under the circumstances. We tap backwards and forwards at the moment. We're out there with the top men yet to come. So pick up Ribeiro and on the front fork that little bit of uh, device sticking down below it and what's happening is they, they are able to in the as they go across the finish line they've got a device now that will pick up the the, 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 the riders through that uh, chip there and we can actually time them as they go across the line through that chip so they have their own computers which do what they want and uh, in addition to the computer which will pick up the revolutions of the wheel with the speed the distance cover the average speed the computers also are picking up off their their, their chest straps, the, their heartbeat as well. In a time trial like this, the top time trialers who are professionals at this sport, people like Chris Borman, know exactly when they're fit, what they've got to do to ride against their heartbeat. And they'll warm up on the rollers to get their heartbeat up to their maximum level, then they get onto the bikes and they'll ride against that. And that's what to, you see is the on the handlebars are their own, uh, their own devices, whereas back down there, that's the one for the organisation to pick up the riders as they go across the finish line. I'm not sure at the moment, I'm just trying to find out from the organization as well that chip also uh, i don't think it'll be picked up from the sky that is i don't think there's a way in which it can't transmit up to a a uh um, a, a GPS system because by GPS we can actually monitor the gap between the riders now they may be able to do it out of a helicopter I don't know, oh, sorry out of a, uh, a satellite but certainly it's a new system where the GPS is enabling the, the team manager to keep an eye on it the gaps that are opening up and they are saying that at some point in time the team manager will have inside their car through those little chips like you saw there on the front wheel sticking down uh, a, a way in which they'll be able to pick up in the bunch exactly where all their riders are so it's no good skiving off and sitting on in the back and having a bit of a you know a quiet time and not doing your work up the front because your team manager will know if he said to you oh, about all you lost on the front a you can see it on television because he's got his own little tv set inside the car uh, but also he'll, he'll have this uh, satellite monitoring system which will enable him to say exactly not only where his riders are but where everybody else's are too and this is getting very complex i mean way that when i was involved when we first started it was not so complex as that and yes you could skive off in the bunch i suppose if you felt like it in the those days but now the team managers can virtually watch anything that moves and put in action some response to the activity and again the riders this was started mainly by Motorola can be linked uh, by uh, the radio systems through their earpieces back to team manager who will tell them what to do and where to go now on occasion like this but it's a time trial as Mr Jalabo starting the motor I mean a past time trial champ in the world and this is a race of truth Jalabo then 57 oh it hasn't stopped has it Sorry about that. But I don't think he'll, he will just about, <laughs> may make the top 10, but only just. That, that's a good sign. Shows he's getting some form back. Anyway, going back to the, um, oh yes, Jalabab uh, at six seconds now behind Ekimov. So that makes him uh, 57.05, if my arithmetic is correct, for Jalabab. So he's lying third. This thing ran on a bit. So flicking back up into the start house again. So as fast as we get one finish, if they didn't stop the clock, we go back up again into the start. Underway, Perez is going. Yes, yeah, so I was saying earlier on about the way in which the riders can be spoken to. Not in the time trial, this is every man for himself racing against the watch uh, that the, um, the 
control of the rides out on the road is, is becoming much more technical over the time. And uh, in fact, that question about the small black box pitch position at the bottom of the forks, this came from Ian Nichols in Slough. And he said that he's seen it on, on some of the riders. He's quite right, there it is. And so that's the one which I'm say I know it's to do with the timing across the line, but I just have a suspicion they're also using it for the GPS thing, but I'll try and find out for it. That's why they've got two of them. That's the little black box you see down there, a little bit thing hanging below. Of course, the trouble is, as we saw the other day, when uh, when you puncture and you drop the front wheel out, if you're not careful, out comes as well. The little black thing drops off the uh, off the bottom of the fork and it goes in the back of the car. And from then on in, I suppose everybody has great difficulty picking out what the heck's going on. Well, one thing about we can see now is still is playing away and causing all sorts of havoc. I'm just looking through my my post and trying to keep an eye on things here, these emails coming through. That's right. I was, I was saying how that the racing today is becoming so much more technical. Uh, Zilla plows along here. Doesn't look too good though, does he? No, no, I think Zilla's still sobbing from yesterday. Maori first 32.56 at that point. Well, he might be able to do it yet. I said you watch out for Maori because he's a uh, character so what's still coming up to oh he's not that far out all right Kevin from Hamilton have gone ahead of him was he going to take them out through there 733 dead Hamilton now he's gone outside that going third might move into oh, it might be fourth by the time he's going 3305 in third spot He should be going quicker than Maori if he's going to win this one. And the trouble is, after the problems he had yesterday, he could start full exuberance, but he might, he's rocking a bit too much. And this looks like Hamilton coming in here. It is. And Casey, his teammate, 56 59 to beat. And I think Hamilton will do it. Great time, Charles. He's knocking hell out of his bike, but uh, 56, he's made it 56 43 then. 56 43, Hamilton, 49.9 can be served. 56 43 the time. A new leader on the board, taking over from his teammate, it was 56 59 before. And look at that, stars and stripes flying up there. Hamilton just ahead of Casey. Pretty quick character. So, what's Silla coming up to? Oh, he's not that far out. Well, Kevin from Hamilton have gone ahead of him. Was he going to take them out through there? 32, 57, 33, dead Hamilton. Now he's gone outside that. Going third. Might move into. Oh, it might be fourth by the time he's going. 33, 05. In third spot. Well, he should be going quicker than Mara if he's going to win this one. And the trouble is, after the problems he had yesterday, he could start full exuberance, but he might, he's rocking a bit too much. And this looks like Hamilton coming in here. It is. And Casey, his teammate, 56 59 to beat. And I think Hamilton will do it. Great time, Charles. He's knocking hell out of his bike, but uh, 56, he's made it 56 43 then. 56 43, Hamilton, 49.9 can be served. 56 43 the time. A new leader on the board, taking over from his teammate, it was 56 59 before. And look at that, stars and stripes flying up there. Hamilton just ahead of Casey. And still, he's got this limpet stuck on his back wheel. Maori, who went through the fastest we had so far. At that check, 32 minutes, 56 seconds. This lad behind, by the way, I, I, I'm going to say prejudge it, but I suggest he's got to get his wrist slapped before, well, by the time he gets to the finish.
he's, he's still hovering there. He hasn't come past Maori. He's been using Maori for the last, I don't know, five, ten minutes we've been on air as, as a benchmark. And uh, this is not allowed no time. I think providing he lays out here, he's not too bad, but uh, he's got to watch out. He might be in trouble. We're back with Alex Zuller then, who has been cleaving his way through the intermediate time checks, but hovering still in around that second spot. This man, Melka Maori, on your screen, the black and red on the right, on left-hand side, has been set in the fastest time. The last time check we had at the point there, 32.56, Zilla 33.05, but the fastest time at the finish, uh, Hamilton 56.43, as Zinchenko gets underway. Now at two minutes intervals, next man to go to Zinchenko will be uh, uh, William McRae from the Mape Quick Step team, the, the American, finding himself up there. And I'm sure he'll be very pleased to come out there in this uh, very hot sunshine and perform. The Americans doing uh, very well indeed at international racing. We know we had suddenly Lance Armstrong taking the Tour of France, very dedicated performance. He finished fourth last year. This is a disappointment for another American here, uh, Bobby Julik, who has really still not recovered from that terrible crash in the Tour de France on the time trial, Metz Metz. And so Bobby coming through there at 59.42. Uh, Hamilton still the leader, 56 minutes, 40, uh, 50, 43 seconds. Hunter down the left-hand side, the South African, who got that stage victory uh, in the tour on the first day and took over the leader's jersey. I think Maurer's going to try and get rid of this chap. That's the point then at 33 kilometers 39.23 well Maori's ahead here on this particular point Ekimov, Hamilton and Casey all locked in combat there Hamilton having had the fastest time so but Ekimov faded towards the end because Ekimov came in the end at uh, 57 minutes and one second Hamilton having gone past it came through in 56.43 so Ekimov faded a bit on the run in towards the end so Maori looks like he could be setting the benchmark for everything that happens there afterwards you've had to really another man as well it's what I expected for Maori. These starters you were seeing earlier on were starting at one minute intervals. We go back then to young McRae from the Mappe Quick Step dos, team, the American. Uno, underway. Let me just dig out a bit of information from what's been happening in the last couple of days. I've mentioned about the Americans and how they're going. Uh, we went out then and picked up uh, McRae at the start. In the, um, the tour of L'Avenir, which is the, uh, the, the Espoirs, it's the, it's the young riders uh, who are riding much their own version of the Tour de France, we had an amazing situation on the day before yesterday. I didn't have time to tell you yesterday, because yesterday, once we came out from the gun, the proverbial hit the fan, it was one of those long days, when, uh, or short days, when everything happened right in front of us. And now again, Malcolm Maori catching up again with his, uh, his two-minute man, taking him on board. Maori's building up his own little personal uh, group race here. He caught up with uh, Morini from the Liquid Gas team. He's now hauled in as well, the, the chap from Riso Scotty, that's uh, uh, Sapinakas. And he's also been past the uh, Vichario uh, from the uh, Funnel Avada team. So he's now caught one, two, three riders, has, uh, has Malcolm Maurer on his way through. Down the road in front of him is uh, Aito Osa, Osa of Bonesto. So if he catches him as well, that's, it's a real hatful today, isn't it? And again, going back to time trialling, which I know many of the British viewers here love that particular sport, it's great when you're going well and you're riding one minute intervals, uh, then you can see the chaps down the road, you start reeling them in one after the other, one after the other. But over this sort of distance, uh, 46 kilometres, you don't often catch this number of minute men. This fellow's just cleaving his way through the field. The reason is uh, when in, uh, in time trialling, they, they normally back in Great Britain, they're graded. You put the fast men on the, on the 10 mark. So as we go back up into the start house, um, the, the, the time trial in Great Britain running at one minute intervals on every 10 spot you'll get um, the, the, the fastest battle of that, that particular group uh, of because they, they grade them all according to their uh, their entry form so they've got some idea of what the best is and they put, keep the best towards last anyway and uh, having the, the fast men at 10 minute intervals means that the fast men don't often get uh, amongst each other 
and but nevertheless they catch their own little 10 group but you don't often a 25 mile time trial over 30 miles start catching the number we've just seen Maori catch so Martin uh, Pedigello has been performing extremely well so far in this race but he lost out yesterday he was another those rides over three minutes down yeah and it looks as if Zula has now caught his other man in front of him Mr. Gwadowski coming in here winner of the championship of Zurich the other week not one of the world's greatest uh, stylists. Look at his left leg going. Flick, 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 flick. His knee is coming in most ghastly style. But as we saw him in the uh, Championship of Zurich, that he used that style to great effect to win the thing and just destroyed everybody by his ability to ride into the finish and grab it. Ah, in fact, now, the man who's been wheel sucking, well, he hasn't sucked too much of his wheel, but he's been sort of drifting along behind Mr. Marius. Now, look, he's nipped off down the road and giving Marius something to go for. Might either help or offend Mr. Murray, I don't know, because eight kilometers to go, he's got about 10 minutes left of, uh, of racing ahead of him, and the man he caught for one minute has now gone off down the road again, but Murray's reeling lots of other chaps, so here becomes that, that was, Azula's doing his thing, he's reeling in menace too, because they wouldn't normally find themselves this close to Zula. Maori and Zula started today just four minutes apart on the general classification, so uh, sorry, on the start list. So that's a bit of benchmark, but we don't seem to be getting any uh, big times for, um, for Zula, which says he's a threat. Uh, we saw him going through the, the time at the uh, time check at 32 minutes 56 for Maori. Second was Zula, 33.05. So there was only some uh, nine seconds in it as Nierman from the Rabobank team gets underway, so perhaps Zola might be coming good towards the end, as we've just seen that uh, Maori's lost to uh, Mourinho. Mourinho's gone off down the road. Right, I was talking about Americans, wasn't I? Way back down. Yes, yes, I'll get back there in the end. Like, tuk, tuk, you won't say in the Tour de l'Avenir um, that, uh, that we had the day for yesterday, we had Chris O'Jenna win the stage, McGee second, Barchero third, but the, that man Floyd Landis of the USA Mercury team took over the lead of the race. This is Malcolm Maori setting the fastest time so far for the Benfica team. Coming towards the end of his very illustrious career, but uh, moving on to the Portuguese Benfica team, he's now been keeping his powder dry, ready for this time trial, and certainly I think this is an occasion when he feels that uh, he can uh, do well to respond to his sponsor, who's uh, taken him on board, and there he is now hammering along his fastest times all the way through. 48 minutes up on the screen shows you how fast he's been going, and we expect him to finish overall probably around about uh, 50... Uh, Six minutes, which should be his time, the rate he's going, so he's not got long to go in towards the finish. Again, riding on this unique uh, giant bicycle with that enormous seat tube uh, sticking out of there. And there's all this discussion about bike designs and things that should be changed, and we don't, and the UCI want to cast things in tablet stone. There does seem to be a drift in their thinking now, and they're saying, yes, you can have these sloping top tubes. I don't quite know what, I think it's 16 centimetres or something. You can have sloping top tubes. Um, Big Peter Lumley, the editor of Bicycle Trade Industry, sent me a little email saying that they have uh, uh, amending certain parts of the technical regulations, but he goes on to say he's not on high for Brooklyn's list of Christmas cards recipients because <laughs> Peter Lumley has been saying some outrageous things quite rightly in the trade press about the stupidity of stopping bike design and saying you can't have sloping top tubes etc because the answer is why can't you have a sloping top tube and in fact if you go back as Brochard sets underway now uh, there's this picture in the this month's Velo the American, not the American Velo, the, the French Velo of Indrain in the time trial as Brochard who set the whole thing like yesterday now wearing the King of the Mountains uh, jersey having got all those points yesterday gets underway there was the picture in the French cycling magazine uh, September issue of some of the great exploits and amongst the great exploits uh, in the big tours was the one when over 65 kilometres averaging more than 49 kilometres an hour was uh, Miguel Indurain Robocop himself uh, in the 
uh, Tour de France when we had that superb time trial. I think it was 1992, it was certainly up there at Luxembourg. We, he demolished everybody, and the picture in there is of Indrain plowing along, great big chap, with a sloping top tube, but not like the giant one we just seen. It went the other way. It went from the seat tube down to the head tube. It went the other way because those are days what they all call low profile bikes. And the great thing was, was to have the saddle uh, pinned very small, and so you built the frame up to it, and so you've got a, a, a sloping top tube going forwards, not downwards. So Bill had been mucking around with bike design for an awful long time, trying to make them that bit quicker. But uh, any bike rider will tell you the bike doesn't make a lot of difference because look at the legs flying around here and your body and everything else. The turbulence and, the, and what have you is up at the top end and the bike below is... Uh, not the most important thing, but psychologically you want the best equipment. And if you can think you shaved a, a fraction of a second off through having a, a, with thinner frames or different size wheels or something, and somebody will tell you that's going to make you go faster, uh, then you'll say, right, I'll try it. And uh, I think it adds to the sort of the, the interest looking things physically. There we are, the Kilometer 27, and I've enough uh, unlucky 13 for some, but uh, still pressing on. And don't forget that you can still vote then to see who's going to be the, the winner of the race. And uh, we've already seen that the fastest time was Hamilton 56.43. And for Great Britain, 0906 614 to guess the winner of the race today. If you can predict that, you'll get a star prize. I'll find out what it is for you in just a moment. I shall buzz the little button and add back to the what we call the Regie in Paris, where they give us all the information, because I don't know it's going to be a gold watch or a, or a Eurosport T-shirt, maybe a, a free trip to... Uh, where would I like to go? Blackpool for the illuminations. Anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. I shall find out what the prize is for you. It might even just be a, a nice bottle of Rioja. We shall find out for you as Atienza gets underway. Back out with uh, Malcolm Ari, who's setting up the fastest time so far. See his nice little low-profile um, handlebars as well to cleave through the air. And he's not riding with a very long extension on his, uh, his triathlon bars either. He's quite a chunky sort of chap. He's settling back in again, very powerful. And I was talking about how psychologically people have been doing all sorts of things with the, with the top. You see this one, he's got it going the other way. This is, this is the old low profile, the chap on the right hand side. You see that's the old low profile system where it went down from the saddle, down to the, the front wheel. Look at those two bikes. Those are the sharp contrasts. One with the... Oh God, it's, it's turned into a road race. Oh. Time trialling often is it's supposed to be a race of truth, one man against the watch, and you've got here Malcolm Harris going along collecting people all the time. Yes, I'm sure he's caught uh, uh, Osa. That's Osa, I think, in the blue and white. He's caught him. He's collected as well uh, Morini in the black and green. He's already collected Vicciari, the full of the rider, and he's just going along here. They're all hanging off for a grim death. <laughs> well, the judges will be watching that little up. Back in the, into the start house. This is Serrano next to go. And after him, it'll be uh, Sharo. These riders are going at two-minute intervals, by the way. Uh, the, the earlier starters went at one-minute intervals, and now we're on to two-minute intervals for the, uh, the riders you're seeing on your screen here. In fact, we shifted from the one-minute intervals to uh, two-minute intervals after we came through the, uh, the riders uh, in the, well, from the Roberto onwards. So Serrano going. Part of the skirmishing yesterday, which went on when the Onsay team set about ripping the legs off uh, Benesto. So back out on the road uh, with Nierman. And he's amongst the whole gang of Bloridas. They're over three minutes down. Uh, Nearman, what, about 3.30 something? I'll check it for you. Yes, he's three minutes, 38 seconds down uh, on the on the classic out. And seeing the Rabobank uh, rider here on your screen, Robbie McEwen, who's, I think he's already finished now, Robbie McEwen, the sprinter we've been seeing up trying to take over the, the lead in this particular race and grab himself some stage victories. And of course, he got the final stage on the Tour de France and the Champs-Élysées this year. Uh, Robert McEwen is also thinking of getting on the move away from Rabobank and there's people talking about him going on to the Farm Freaks team. Farm Freaks are saying that they're going to keep Blylevans, uh, who wants to go off to Pulte. So there's a lot of negotiations going on and transfer market all happening. And I think it'll all be sort of 
not exactly totally resolved, but by the time we get to the World Championships in October, things might be able to be settling down. But some of these riders, if you do want to transfer out to somebody else and get yourself in a team next year, you've got to start going well if you haven't done so well so far this season. And uh, this is an ideal opportunity. The Tour of Spain, moving it to, from the April-May period to this part of the year, certainly has uh, given people a chance of, uh, of showing themselves uh, towards a uh, sponsor. This is younger Shadow, by the way. Shadow going away from the Escatel uh, Escadi team. Nice little climber. I don't think we've seen the last of this fellow, by the way. And uh, I think when we get to the stage the day after tomorrow, when we're going at that almost impossible climb, which is in the Basque country, I'm sure he's been out there practicing. And I think we've got to watch this little fellow. He's, he's quite a chirpy chap and he's climbing well too. So days uh, to come, not Saturday, but Sunday. He's got to be full of a lot of interest. So, Maori coming in toward the finish. This could be, as we pass the devil himself on the left-hand side, and his bike there on the left-hand side there. Uh, this could be the fastest time that we've seen so far. Maori on his way through. So, at least, as I said, now looking at his bicycle here, the UCI have seen a bit of sense and allowing a certain amount of leniency within the uh, sloping top tubes. And uh, But still, I don't think you have wheels like this with a small front wheel and a big back wheel. They're saying they must be equal size for next year. Again, don't ask me why, but uh, they seem to have very good reason. I'm sure that Mr. Bruggen's hair is standing up the back of his neck because I keep talking about these rules. But I've been the bike industry 35 years, I think it was, uh, way back 1952. How, how far was that? When I joined Philip Cycles, not because I was a cyclist, but I joined the advertising department and then went out to be a saddle on the road. I've loved bikes and designs ever since and spent some time doing some bike designs myself. Not physical, technical things very much, but I've, I just enjoy bicycles. And, by God, he's coming up here. Looks like uh, he's also going to try and pull in uh, Maury. Maury of Psycho Cannondale. It started one, two, three, four, five minutes in front of him. There they go across the line. Maury then, 56.30, has taken the lead. Well, he had a hat full of riders. Look all that about him. He has his own little private group here, his own private peloton. But that means that Maori has now well and truly taken the lead. I think he slowed a bit towards the end. 56.43. Uh, Hamilton was 56.43. He was 56.30. So he's, he's shaved 13 seconds off it. That'll stick for a bit, I think. Underway, Sheffer from the research... Scotty Venables. All these chaps you're going to see now, as from Atienza onwards, uh, who's just gone down the road, Atienza, Hirano, Shadow, Schaefer. We've seen all those just, just finish these last uh, four hours, get up, sorry, start, these last four hours get underway. All of that group were in the breakaway the group that yesterday romped into the finish and there anyway, you can see that Hamilton now pushed down into second spot, Casey third, Ekimov fourth and Jalabé into fifth spot at 35 seconds. But uh, we'll wait for the intermediate time check, particularly that one at 27 kilometres, just to see if that situation will change as I think it will. So uh, back out now with uh, Broshar on the road. He was 3 minutes 31 seconds down. He didn't quite make it yesterday in that. He, he led the group in chasing after the brakes, and he was the man who went away to get the points in the Kingdom Man's competition by going quite early on in the stage and going over the, the, the first couple of climbs and uh, getting that white jersey as a Kingdom Man is uh, leader of his teammate, uh, Pascal Hervé. Working hard here. Again, I think it's the last rabbit about position. Here where he is here with his hands in position, and the same thing with uh, Zula. There's going to be a certain measurement between the bottom brackets and the front of where those little gear levers are as well to make sure we don't go into the old Superman positions uh, or the, the tuck position that Aubrey invented over the years. And we, I don't uh, disagree with that, that we should have riders sitting on the saddle over the bottom bracket in certain positions and that the handlebars and everything else in terms of length and stretch should be, I won't say restricted, but uh, not in to those obscure sort of Superman positions that we got, uh, and that I don't, don't disagree with some idea that the UCL would try and put those parameters in there, provided they bear in mind that I'm six foot four and I have to ride a different position from Mr. Pantani, about five foot seven, and some people are only five foot four because you need more stretch, uh, and some of the very small riders might still be able to be well and truly stretched out, whereas we big riders will be still bunched up on the top of our bikes. But at least we're getting some sort of compromises going and some good sense will prevail. Piapuli going away. None of these riders went away in the break yesterday. Let me give you, if you didn't see the result yesterday, a complete rundown on the, uh, the, the 
the, the places of the riders yesterday. Just give you the names of them. They all came in the same time. Three hours, 52 minutes uh, and 56 seconds for the 160 kilometres. That's uh, three hours, 52 minutes for 100 miles. Eh? And it was hilly. Gosh, it was hilly. And the riders, uh, in quick order, finished in this order. Yes, a, a sprint finish from Mr Ulrich took him into the lead. Ulrich yesterday his first spot. Alano second. Vanderbrook third. Rebel in fourth. Casero fifth. Hellas, sixth. Uh, Igor uh, uh, Gonzalez Galdiano, seventh. Uh, Van der Vuba, the lotto rider, good rider, eighth position. Escartin in ninth spot. Beltran, tenth. Zarabetia, eleventh. Tonkov, twelfth. Cuesta, thirteenth. Schaeffer, fourteenth. Shallow, fifteenth. Atienza, sixteenth. Jimenez, seventeenth. Uh, Para, eighteenth. Serrano, nineteenth. Uria, twentieth. Uh, Laiseka, 21st, Pierpoli, 22nd, and Blanco, 23. They were the riders that came in 3 minutes, 17 seconds down. And of that lot, I would suggest to you, when we get into Madrid, you'll have a job getting somebody who's not in that top 23 riders who finished yesterday uh, going into Madrid in a top three place at the end of this tour. You're going to have to be an, an absolute uh, brilliant climber. And just bear in mind, there are, uh, in this particular race, mounting top finishes which could uh, decimate the field. So there may be somebody lurking back there that we know not of. But you, in races, you need to be both a, a pretty good mounting climber and a, a time trialist. So I think that uh, of that the group of the 20 odd riders you're seeing on your screen at the back end of this race, it could be the ones that get to the end in Madrid, uh, the winners of the overall 1999 Tour of Spain. 21 stages, plus the prologue, 3,592 kilometres in all, averaging 163 kilometres, and Zula is suddenly going through an almost bad patch again. All the hopes were on this man, he was recruited by Benesto uh, because they lost Alano, who won this race uh, last year. Zula won the night, the uh, a tour of Spain in 96 and 97, but uh, he suddenly went through a bad patch. And in fact, uh, Alano and his teammates, uh, the Anse teammates, and signs had recognised a couple of days back that Zula didn't look in good form. They attacked him yesterday. They demolished his chances of winning this year's uh, Tour of Spain. He's now going to come round here in uh, quite an unusual position for him in a time trial. He's going to be lucky, I think, at the end of it to finish in the top 20 on the stage today. I wonder, in fact, if he'll finish the race overall. So the gutsy performer may soldier on, but let's see what happens after the Sunday stage, where I think that the big climb we have there, anyone who's not feeling very well will find themselves on Monday morning waking up with a bit more of that average Monday morning feeling. We might find this field being cut even further back as riders realise that they've taken awful pasting. And what has been so far, a very fast race. The overall average speed for the Tour has been over 25 miles an hour. And a lot of riders have taken an awful pasting in this, the uh, 1999 Tour of Spain. By the rider from the Benesto team who yesterday managed to stay with that break. In fact, uh, I said to you early on in the programme that how Zilla had an awful pacing yesterday. They sent back two men to look after him from uh, the Benesto team, but they still did keep uh, some measure of hope alive. And I think perhaps in the end, we might be surprised just how it all works out because uh, uh, Kimenez, who last year finished in third last year when they were both on the same team, uh, was well sheltered and looked after by the rest of his Benesto teammates. In fact, Kimenez will be seen going off in uh, what, uh, another one, two, three, four, five, six riders from now uh, is nicely placed on the overall classification. He's not a great time trialist, uh, Kimenez. He's lying 45 seconds down, but he's an extremely good mountain climber. So the war between the Alano uh, uh, back to, or the uh, Onse back team of Alano and the Bonesto team is not over and done with by any means yet. And one man poised to take advantage of everything is Jan Ulrich, the last man we'll see going off. And if you haven't caught up the result yesterday, he won the stage in a sprint. That was the first success he's had, first victory in just over 12 months of racing because he had a very bad uh, start this season. I'll tell you more about Jan Ulrich when we get towards the back end of the race and his opportunities and chances of perhaps ending up on the rostrum in Madrid at the end of it all. Geras here. Next to go. Cinco, cuatro, tres, dos, uno, salida. And there he goes. Well, again, one of the come. I talk about the battle between the uh, the Onse team and. 
the Benesto team, well, Calme come along as a guerrilla warfare. They're very good at grabbing stage victory. This man's a previous stage victory in the big tours. He's uh, coming along here not to do anything, I think, in this uh, uh, in, in this time trial. He's not the world's greatest time trials, but he, he won a stage in the Tour of Italy this year, did, did Jaraz, and that was a mountainous stage. He romped away what was stage 21, I think it was. So he's an extremely good chap when he comes to what goes up, and he's got to think to ride this race looking after the interests of... Um, of Ascati, who again is an extremely good and super climber. So we're going to see these lads in the green and white taking advantage of, of the warfare between the Anse team and the Benesso team and popping off down the road. Normally they, they hunt in pairs. We saw uh, yesterday coming in towards the finish back once they got up in the mountains and they knew Zilla was in trouble. The Anse team put about four men on the front and rode and rode and rode. And the other day, uh, in fact, no, before that, when the Anse team had sent one man down the road with Brochard right at the start, a dis Justo went away yesterday with Brochard and the Bonesto team chased after them and they had like nine men or certainly eight of them on the front going along hammering after the after the Anse ride so Bonesto and, and Anse inclined to uh, battle in packs whereas the, the Calme team uh, they attack in pairs and they, they, they have a guerrilla warfare whilst the other two teams are battering each other to death with the biggest weapons they can find so it's going to be fascinating watching how this thing evolves the day after tomorrow in the mountains every man for himself and I think this team uh, from the Kelme squad will be giving us something really interesting to, uh, to, to watch right back up then to the start house and this is Zalabetia the Onto Deutsche Bank team Again, one of those riders who was in that group yesterday, and he's looking at the interests of uh, Alano, who will be going off last of all, two minutes behind Ulrich. And there he goes. So the fastest time we've got so far, if you just switched on, uh, is that of Mokamari. 56 minutes and 30 seconds for the 46.4 kilometres. Right, as you said to that, but, um, I was talking earlier on about the little uh, device on the front forks where they can pick up the chip that picks up the riders. And I say it's uh, to do with this uh, going across the finish line, also to do with the global position satellite device that um, I had. And I talked about how they can actually talk to each other by, by well, radios from the team manager up towards the riders as well. If you go back out onto the road, the, I've had a, a fact, it's not an email, from Kevin Bennett, and it came in some time ago, actually, Kevin. Sorry about this, but it, they've been sort of piling up, and I get home so infrequently that they all pile up, and I can't reply to all of them either in writing back to you or by email, so I try and put them out on air, and perhaps during the short gap I have in November and December before having off to Australia for the Tour Down Under, I might be able to reply to some of those where you've asked me specific questions. So please forgive me if I, you don't get a reply. It's not I don't want to be rude. I'm, I'm rude uh, and don't want to reply to you. My first job... When I get home is to get rid of all the paperwork of the particular race I've been on, put it back into the files. There's an enormous filing system that uh, I've, I've got over the years. Get everything tidy and sorted from the race I've just been doing. Then get all the paperwork and things sorted for the next race I'm going to. And this can take uh, all day, sometimes two days, to get this lot sorted. Then, of course, there's the clothes to be sorted out and things to be washed and things to be repacked. I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining that you just hear the old voice coming out there. I think that's not a bad job, but the getting to do it at the morning, the travelling to the starts, the going back to the hotels, the doing the paperwork and getting to bed all hours of God's end. Of course, the food and the wine helps you get through all these trials and tribulations and what it is, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Don Hills get a chance to reply to your faxes and emails. I'm so sorry about that. Now then, Escartin underway. Well, this is the chap finished second last year in the Tour of uh, Spain. Second, se second in the Tour of Spain the year before that. And he really went round the Tour of France this year, opening up people's eyes in the time trial as well because he went on uh, in the Tour de France this year to really surprise a lot of people. I had tipped him there as a chance to finish their top three. He did just that. He finished third overall, did Escartin, as uh, Gwadowski comes in to finish. He was the rather unusual bike riding style and the most unpronounceable name since uh, Ditamini Abdul Japarov uh, stopped cycle racing. Uh, back out with Escartin. And this chap could surprise quite a few people. His time trialing has improved enormously and uh, he won't be struggling, I think, quite the same way he was... Uh, the last uh, year or the previous years in the time trials in the tour. Well, back out on the road and uh, there's this cart in, I think, underway. That's the position at the 46.4 kilometre, the end of this uh, Salamanca Salamanca time trial that uh, 
Mari still the best place rider, but I think all will change, particularly when we see the battle raging when Ulrich and Alano uh, go off last and last but one. Back out then, we're going to have to see how Escartin performs today because it's going to be a big day for him uh, in the saddle an opportunity to just show that he's still in with a shout. Well, his big day uh, will be when we go, not tomorrow, but the day after on the big mountain. Climb. We're back up with his teammate here, Jerez, a useful little mountain climber. And uh, you can hear the shouting going on behind. And I was talking earlier on about the way in which they can communicate with the rider, apart from that little satellite dish, satellite system down there, little, little uh, red thing. This is Escartima back now. And you see, not the most stylish of riders, um, a bit all hunched up uh, and a bit sort of a bit bandy-legged and a bit inclined to sort of fight his bike occasionally, except when it comes to the mountains. And uh, I was mentioning he looks a bit like Robert Miller, but I think it was Stephen Rotem said, we know, but Robert Miller always used to sit sideways on the saddle, and I can't remember that, but anyway, not dissimilar. Back then with, uh, with uh, uh, Tonkov underway. And this chap's got to do something in this tour. He's, let me give you a quick rundown on where he is on a general classification. He's 47 seconds, Tonkov, uh, down on Alano, the leader in the race uh, at the moment. And Tonkov he was not doing well in the Tour of France this year. He didn't ride the Tour of Italy, in a race which he's uh, sort of dominated in the past. The, his whole ambition this year, Tonkov, was to do well in the Tour de France. Unfortunately, he took a bit of pace. He wasn't going as well as he could do. And then when his father-in-law died, he hopped off home, and that was it. But he is a specialist in when it comes to the big tours. And I think that somehow uh, we might find him. He's got to do something today, by the way, Tonkov, because the, uh, the on the mountainous stage, there we are, that's the position of uh, Maori, uh, Zula and Nekimov, uh, first, second and third and Hamilton back in fourth. Nice to see the Stars and Stripes going there in fourth and fifth spot. But uh, I think that Tonka might surprise a few people, but he'll be, he's got to go some today in the time trial, where he's pretty good at that too. But um, because he needs a bit of time in the bank, ready for when we hit the big climb on Sunday, because that's going to frighten a lot of people. And when we do, when we get up there, uh, then they can lose a lot of time. But I think that uh, Tonkov today has got to do what he can to stop up in contention and then struggle over that climb best he can do. So he did have a bit of a bad patch in the Tour de France this year, but uh, let's see how he turns out this time. He's got to save something for the season, not having uh, been uh, competing in the, the Tour of Italy because uh, he decided to go for the Tour de France instead. Tetra coming in. very quickly to the thing I was talking about transmission between the riders and the and, and the race itself so the next man to go off he goes so I think the Kelme riders I think we're going to have seen most of them underway now yes uh, Jimenez will be the next one to come um, so there he goes, and within a couple of minutes from now, we're going to have uh, Jimenez, the man who finished third last year, up in the start house, ready for his 46.6 kilometres. Well, back out then uh, with Belter on the road here for Bonesto. And they've got their work cut out, I think, uh, in the onslaught, which will happen the day after tomorrow in the mountains. But he's quite a little time tries, and uh, let's see what he does over this 46.4 uh, kilometre circuit. Salamanca, Salamanca. We've been here before on the Tour of Spain with a time trial. If I just dig out the results for you then. The last time we had a time trial here it was over a 41-kilometre course, slightly shorter. And Alana won that one. So any uh, significant pointer to 1995's success by uh, Alano in the time trial, that was when he got it. At that particular 95, Alano had taken the, the prologue time trial and went on uh, on stage seven. So it's very close to this sort of time scale we've got now to take the uh, the success in the time trial. He didn't take the lead, though, by the way, because Jalabert had won the stage up to Alto Naranco uh, on the on stage three. It was a small uphill, but a bit of uphill finish anyway, and Jalabert survived that one, won the stage, took the jersey, and then kept it right the way through to the finish. But Alano Salabanca Salamanca, the 41 kilometre time trial, uh, he won that one. He's the last man to go. McRae going through. The actual distance, um, I like to translate these things into English money as well. It's 29 miles, uh, the, the course they're coming today. So imagine for a 29 mile a course that the, the fastest time we've got so far, that of Malcolm Maori, uh, 56 minutes 30. 
the fastest time over that distance quite quick isn't it that's well over 30 miles an hour because 56 minutes got a bit, bit in hand hasn't he over the 40 uh, 30 30 miles an hour oh 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 mr mccray you are moving here can he hang on to that so look at the gap he's open up there that's now that's to turn up for the books the americans certainly catching us all napping and um, good on it, boys. I'd like to see this the way the Americans are starting coming up and from that. Because, you know, in America, it, sport cycling is almost unknown, but it's a sport which doesn't have any like, recognition. We over here recognize the Americans and what they're doing, but uh, back in America, it's a bit like baseball in Great Britain. Nobody knows anything about it, or very little about it, except until Armstrong won the Tour de France and went up to meet uh, Clinton, of course, uh, way back when uh, Greg LeMond was winning the Tour, too. But once the, the great success goes away and it levels itself back off again, it's like chucking a brick in a pond and sort of the ripples go away and after a while it's all still on top of the pond again and cycling america goes through that from time to time it's uh, at the moment a lot of people know about Arms armstrong he's been on the big television shows and his, his name's there everywhere and of course work riding as he does for the u.s postal team they're making sure it goes well and truly all across the whole of the country they promote it because they're the big um, post company employing tremendous number of people so they will do what they can to promote it and encourage people the americans have got uh, i think i've got 90 odd professionals registered They've got a very good number of pros in America, plus a lot more top elite riders. But the trouble is when they're racing over there, they've got to go thousands of miles sometimes, 3,000 miles from one side to the other, to, to get involved in their racing, travelling there, travelling back. It's a uh, very onerous uh, job to be a pro racer in America. And a lot of the teams now begin to move out and tackle the European scene as well. And some of the riders are coming through quite good. It's Gartin here. You might say too, and watch this Gartin padding along as to why the, um, the Americans are, are interested that much in, in oh, why, why Mappe, for instance, with McRae, were interested in America. And the answer is that Mappe got quite a big business in America with their uh, industrial cements and glues and so on. Back with uh, Escartin. I told you, not the greatest style. This is it, rocking around here. But it took him to that third place in the Tour de France this year. And he did survive well in the time trials and that's something he's taught himself to do Delhi for Cofidis oh, I don't think you'll end up make it into the top uh, 20 places overall there's a lot, a lot of big hitters yet to come Casero the Spanish champion going through Already he's been getting his ear bent by his following car. Oh, I'll talk about the shouting guy. Let, I'll try and get this out of the way. I know this is getting exciting now and all these top chaps are coming through. It's not easy for, for, to uh, divert into other things, but I, I have been trying to get a little story into it. You heard him shouting down the headphone here. I've had a, an email from Kevin Bennett who said that um, uh, about the, the communications going on between team cars and so on. And is well, there a, a system to have communication between uneven match cyclists, uh, i.e., couple, often climb at different speeds, get out of the other's sight? He said, so far, this is my fan being impractical, being handheld. Um, could I raise this subject on one of my transmissions? Now, uh, Kevin, there has been advertised in Cycling Press recently, the monthly magazine, I think even Cycling Weekly too, uh, a handset from Motorola, who sponsored a cycle racing team, you may remember a few years ago, very famous was it, was too, well, Mr. Jim Okovich. And many of the, the stores in Great Britain are now stocking this system. And I, I'm investigating myself as a matter of interest. It's a handheld two-way radio system and it's got a, several channels if I said 100 it might be 50 we've got lots of channels on it and select in such a way you, you don't get um, confusion and it runs up to I think anywhere between one mile and, and, and two and a half miles so there's quite a, a, a gap in which it will go depending of course whether in the midst of a, fo a, a, a forest or in the midst of a, a built up area but on f at flat areas like this you could uh, get messages across and certainly the uh, I've seen adverts with mountain bike riders you know, talking to each other across mountains with this, this new system uh, and you, well, it's, it's, it's almost handheld, but in reality, they've also got earpieces and as part of the equipment. And also, there's a 
a mouthpiece. So I wouldn't investigate it totally, but I would think if you've got that system and you had it, say, up on your, your, your jersey and you stitched it against your shoulder of your jersey and you had the, uh, the earpiece and the mouthpiece there, the device would send the information to you. And so you just press the button, you and your mates could be riding along on that frequency and talking to each other, even with your hands uh, uh, still on the handlebars. I don't quite know how it works, but certainly there are earpieces, there are mouthpieces, and it's a, a little device, a bit bigger than a fag packet, so it's not going to be very heavy. And I think uh, the price was about 90 quid. Uh, then the accessories go on top of that, and I suppose you might have some way of charging the batteries, or the batteries last for a certain... Whatever it is, I've, I haven't got all the information, but uh, Kevin did ask me whether there's something you can use, and I think I should investigate that, Kevin, if I were you. If you are going out with one of your friends and you get split on the road, and well, he's off ahead of you on the mountain bikes, and you want to talk to somebody, I think you might find a way of doing it. And of course, again, if you're a record breaker uh, going on a record and you want to be in communication with the car behind you, again, you could stick that in your pocket and your team manager behind you could tell you if you're up or down on schedule or whatever the case may be. So I think it could be quite useful. A number of cyclists will end up using the system uh, for you know, just touring purposes or mountain bike racing and or time trialing or record breaking. And it's, uh, it looks to be quite good to me. Right. Keep it left coming through. Oops, out of the way. Much interest with Mr. Scarton, as you might imagine, on your screen here. The uh, Calme Costa Blanca Eurosport team, one of the longest sponsored teams that have been around for an awful long time now. And here is Scarton. Well, you imagine how he's progressed over the years. In 1992, when he rode the Tour de France, he finished in 45th spot. And here we are, 1999, seven years later, he's up there on the podium in, in third spot. He went on uh, 13th in 1993, 12th in 1994, 17th in 1995, working his way up all the way through. And uh, so you can see how you progress. The same thing with his rides in the Tour of Spain. He's been gradually moving himself up uh, as a Scartin, and he's finished twice uh, in succession in second spot, 97, 98. Now, Para underway here. Very famous name, Para, from uh, Colombia. He sets off here, Vitalis Seguros rider. He is, I think, their best placed rider on the general classification. No, there's another one, uh, Igor uh, Gonzalez Galdiano, who took the time trial, trial time trial on day one. And Para coming through here. It's a very famous name because uh, Para, I'm going back how heck a long time now, was one of the best mountain climbers we had from Colombia. Not perhaps quite as good as Gerard. Uh, uh, but um, don't come back out the road. Looking good. Yep, hasn't missed a beat so far. Good, good, strong, steady time trialist. Looks a bit chunky, doesn't he, when it comes to climb up mountains, but he can get up them too. He's, he's not the mountain goat fella, but he's got that ability as um, is so necessary with... Uh, racing cyclist to recover when you get back to the hotel at night and get up the next day. A lot of bike riders can't stand the, the sort of 20 odd days of racing day in, day out. And But some of them can. Some of them get better as things goes on. Getting down, the next one to go after Para will uh, be Rebelin. And then Vandenbroek Cuesta, uh, Igor Gonzalez Galdiano, uh, then young Ulrich and Abra Milano in that order. So here we are, Rebelin underway. Two minutes after him, Frank Vandenbroek. Well, he did a great ride yesterday to go up with the uh, the top brass and stay in contention. He could be, again, a bit of a dark horse in this race, uh, David Rebellin. He's been getting in some quite good form in the back end of this year, and I think he might be somebody who could uh, surprise a few people. We'll have to wait and see them. Krimner's now out on the road. Uh, also, one of the top uh, half dozen in this race may even end up there, and the roster in Madrid wearing the gold jersey. We shall see. Well, Frank Vandenbroek on the line, superb ride he did yesterday and came in to finish in fifth spot. He went with that group that went over the top of the climb and after that 
a bad patch in his career this year when uh, his team just suspended for a short while while they cleared up a few problems that are hanging about the place. It wasn't, in the end, proved to be anything, but here he goes now, Frank Vandenbroek, to see what he can do in this time trial. And I think he should do quite well today, but again, the question mark's going to hang over him as to what will happen when we get to the uh, back end or uh, on Sunday of the big climbs and back in this race with some of the enormous big uh, mans we've got. Start the season in good form by uh, winning the Over to La Marseille, went on stage in the Vuelta Andalusia, won the, won the Het Folk, uh, won a stage the Paris-Nice and uh, the Age Bertrand Liège, of course, that was his great ride this year. So we'll have to wait and see exactly what he does uh, in the big mountains, but Frank Vanderbroek out on his way through. Just after Vanderbroek, next go will be uh, Inigo Cuesta and then the last three, Galliano, Ulrich and uh, Alano. Just having a quick little look amongst these masses of papers, if I can lay my hands back on again. Uh, Jimenez in this in the time trial last year in the Tour of Spain. We had a time trial. If I can find a bit of paper, I can just tell you where he got to. He's not, again, the world's greatest time trialist, but my goodness, he can climb the mountains. He isn't built like the traditional mountain climbers, a little, little goat. Um, in the time trial uh, in the, what... The, the, the second one we had, tw stage 21, uh, Jimenez was actually lying third overall in general classification, two minutes, 12 seconds down. In that time trial, he wasn't even in the, in the top 10. Uh, so, to show how much he can lose, and uh, we go back, in fact, the first time trial, he wasn't in the top 10 either then. So, Jimenez uh, is now doing something he doesn't like most of all, that's time trialling. And Cresta underway. Well, he'll certainly ride... He, I don't think he's going to ride himself into a frazzle, this chap. He's going to ride around this uh, course at a fairly quick rate of knots, but his job is going to be really, uh, I think, as he's done before. He's been a very a good team man. He's worked for Jalaba in the past, to uh, uh, Cuesta, and I think with, uh, he's going to be looking after Alano in the mountains the day after tomorrow because that's where he comes into his own, although he has been allowed a certain amount of... Uh, Linnis to go out and have a crack on his own behalf. And I think, if you may remember, we, when we were covering the one, uh, he won the Vuelta Vasco in 1998. And there he goes. But most of the time, spends his life riding for other people. Finished, therefore, in seconds and thirds and fourths all over the place. But that's the job of domestics. And last year, Jimenez, his job was to act as domestic to Avram Milano who won the Tour of Spain and then went on to switch allegiances from the Bonesto to the Onse team. So you can see what I'm talking about, how they will switch their allegiances, how the, um, how, how the enmity, what's the enmity, but the, the way in which the two teams try and sort each other out. And in particular, the, the fans, they're either Bonesto fans or they're Onse fans, and you get the smashing of the people interested, Kelme and so on. So you get this great interest of cycle racing all across Spain. It is the big sport as far as they're concerned, because when you think about it, how many uh, Formula One car drives they've got, they've had the, the odd sort of tennis player here and there, maybe the, the odd, odd athlete, the odd runner, but I don't think I've, I've seen a Spanish swimmer. They're sort of Spanish sports, if you look at them, uh, one of the big things they're very good at is cycle racing. They're good at football too as well, but certainly when it comes to cycling, this is one of the sports where they internationally can succeed, and that's why the, the, the fans follow it so avidly and follow it happens with the team. This is Igor uh, Gonzalez Galdiano, who did that superb ride on the opening part of the uh, tour this year when in the, the time trial stayed in Murcia was six kilometres. He won that one by one second from Abra Milano. And Martin Pedicarero, who's already gone out round the course, was into third spot. Uh, he was, I said, a bit fortunate, uh, uh, we said at the time, because the rain came down, and except for Arno, when it dried out a bit, a lot of the later starters didn't have the conditions. But I think this chap's shown since then. He's got a lot more talent than many people gave him credit for uh, when he took over that jersey. It's, ah, well, it rained, and therefore uh, he got the advantage of that. But he, he stayed with the racing. He's managed to go through yesterday with that uh, terrible purge and came in uh, to finish in the run-in towards the, the finish then up there in seven spot, which has kept him now on the classification in contention. Back out on the road then with Casero, the Spanish champion. That's why he's got the yellow uh, flash round about him, because his team... What the, the, the Spanish do, by the way, is they uh, get permission 
well they get permission they must do uh, to alter the jerseys their team jerseys to take into account the the sponsors colors and so on because if you go and ride um, if you look at some jerseys they the old days you have to always wear the national champions jersey irrespective that was it bang on it went which meant that the sponsors colors were often completely secondary to look at the jersey but here you can see the the yellow being imposed upon the the jersey of the Vitula Seguros jersey because normally they're red with the white patches where you see the yellow bit that's normally white so they've uh, allowed to have this little bit of adjustment to the the jerseys so that it can still look like the national champion but also his team car you see here in the red and white the team colors uh, can be maintained you see the headphones in the back this this is where all the time checks come in they have a lot oh, back now. this is it this man yesterday got himself back on the top of everybody's list of outstanding bike riders by coming back from almost oblivion he's had a disastrous season with his bronchitis early in the season his troubles with his knee kept him out of the tour of france and from then on because the crash in the race in hamburg which also knocked his knee about he's been under a lot of pressure and in fact he wasn't even thinking he would like to ride the tour of spain this year he was disillusioned he'd lost his morale but he went out with boldinger his mate another of his teammate riders and they went to a motorcycle race and boldinger's uh, nephew was racing there and i'll go back and tell you that story as we watch casero here because Jan Ulrich went to this motorcycle race with Boldinger, where the nephew was racing, and there were 150,000 people there. And the announcer spotted Ulrich in the crowd, and he mentioned his name. And Ulrich's name reverberated round this enormous racetrack, and they all cheered, and he had to acknowledge it. And he said then that although he said he didn't want to ride the tour of Spain. He felt he had to go out for his public and do something, as we see Nardello finishing here. And Walter Goodfriend, his team manager, said, you must go. And so he's gone. And we'll go back out shortly and pick up the man. I'll repeat this story again when we see a lot more of him. But to really, to see the way that Ulrich has lost a lot of weight. In fact, he's only one kilo over his uh, Tour de France winning race uh, weight in 1997. So I'll go back and repeat that for you because I started down it. I thought you'd like to have it. Then you'd like to know. And we go back out again with that story because Ulrich really is going, I think, to make a lot of people uh, worry about uh, what he can do later on in this race. Can he beat Alano? Can he beat Escartin? Well, the big climbs are yet to come, but this is a time trial. This is a speciality, the world time trial champion, uh, Abra Alano, wearing the gold jersey as the overall leader on the... Uh, the tour of uh, Spain. You understand the moment the uh, results for those voting for the world uh, people are saying that Alex Zuller should win, uh, Bramalano second and Jan Ulrich uh, third. This is, a, this is the results at the moment for the winner of the stage. We've taken into account those telephone results coming in. Well I think unfortunately when no, Zuller is, uh, is not uh, is not going to do it now because Maori's done better than that but I would keep my uh, eyes on Jan Ulrich. Alano certainly starts today 10 seconds better on General Classificator than Ulrich but I think Ulrich might well win the stage today. Uh, back out then with uh, David Rabelin of the Polti team. Had a very big season so far. He started out with a bang. He had four uh, successes right early on. The Tour of Mediterranean, which he won a stage. Overall became winner of the Tour of Mediterranean. Then he went on to take the Tour of the Oak Far. Uh, stage in the Critium International as well. And he's been uh, up there all the way through this season. Long, long old time. He rode the Tour of Italy as well. And so let's see what he's going to do on this particular day. I think certainly if he rides well, he can end up in the, uh, the top uh, 10 overall in this classification at Abelim. Very much the, again, one of the white hopes of Italy, started out in good form, then began to lose a bit of his, uh, his, his, his I don't know what you call it, his sort of enthusiasm for the sport, but he's coming back good now. Way back in 92, he turned pro, and really they looked upon him as going to be somebody good, but uh, it didn't quite come out. It's much better this year, though. Likes the tours, too. He's been a past... Uh, Winner of a stage in the Tour of Switzerland and uh, kept the leader's jersey for six days. I remember we covered that one as well. 
And of course, back in 97, he came good then when he won the uh, Grand Prix Swiss in Zurich and also the Classical San Sebastian. He's also been a man who's taken over the pink jersey in the Tour of Italy when he's won stages there too. So he's, he's good when it comes to these uh, stage races. Beltram, well, you can see there, 45th. There's no sense of Beltran to really bust a gut today. His job will be in looking after Jimenez in the climbs yet to come. And many of these climbers, even though he's, he's not a short little mountain goat, he's quite a long, lanky fellow. He can get up the big mountains, and that's going to be his job, uh, looking after Jimenez as we get later on during this race. Tomorrow, nothing spectacular. I'll just have a quick uh, recheck of the, the route for tomorrow. I think we're going to have a, a quiet day tomorrow on Saturday. I say quiet, you can never know because on the days when everybody thinks they're going to take a bit of a rest and we move off from uh, Salamanca on the stage up into Leone, that stage is quite a long one, 217 kilometres. And in fact, there's not a mountain at all tomorrow. Salamanca, Leone, 217 kilometres. It's flat. Again, we'll be back on air with uh, Eurosport from uh, about half past two Central European time, half past one. Uh, UK time on that stage it worked its way through so uh, it'll be a day I think when the people who, today who want to challenge for the overall honours can really uh, belt themselves and then hope tomorrow just to sit in the main pack and allow the people like Jackie Durand and Mr Rossioli to entertain us with their long loan breakaway attempts because that I think is going to be for tomorrow but for today for this time trial uh, the mountain climbers again won't uh, go too hard the Achilles and the Cowboy boys might want to ride reasonably well for the, the team position in the competition, but again, they don't want to get to, too uh, tired, uh, ready for that uh, tremendous stage we've got on Sunday. I hope you can find time to join us on Sunday for that uh, stage, because I think we're, we're having to cut and edit it and do certain things with that from our live commentary because of the way which other reds are on. But we've got a most stupendous climb, the like of which everybody's been holding their breath to see the riders go up on, on, on Sunday. McRae coming through, well, look, 56, 29 to beat. He might do it. This is something. Wow, the American, if he pulls this one off and McRae comes, he got it, 56, 13.2. Wow, stars and stripes. Here we go again. 56, 13 for McRae. Well, that really is tremendous. Who would have thought it? And I suppose I said, McRae, who's he? Who's he? McRae. And they're, all, they're always scrabbling around looking at their books, and I'm one of them too, because there he is, McRae, 56 uh, 13. That has really surprised a few people. Look at those stars and stripes up there. First, third, and fourth are uh, the stars and stripes uh, waving magnificently after that tremendous performance by McRae. And that's going to take some stopping. Well, I hadn't got him on the shortlist. Anybody out there in the competition we had so far got McRae? I doubt it. Not, not even Bill, Bill Clinton probably put him down as a victor. But perhaps when the tapes get back to Lance Armstrong, he said, yeah, I know that chap. I know he can go a bit. And so I'm not surprised he can do it. Zadabacha back here. Again, having ridden very hard yesterday, I don't think it's going to be his sort of uh, his day to um, get up there in the top, uh, top ten. Yeah, I just checked back through McRae, and um, yeah, we saw him in the Tour of Italy, I remember that. Um, he was, what, he had a fourth on stage 17, and he rode through the Tour overall, finishing 48th spot in the, in the Tour of, uh, of, of, of Italy. He, he came into the season this year riding for Mappe from the Saturn team. Uh, Saturn, the American-sponsored uh, team, and he suddenly surprised, I think, a few people there with that, with that performance, McRae from uh, America riding for the Mappe team. The reason I said also that Mappe have got him in the team is that uh, Mappe got great interest in, uh, in America. Uh, and so, in fact, all over the world, that's why they go to the Tour Langkawi up there in Malaysia, as we back out with, uh, uh, with, with Jan Ulrich, because they've got interest out there. So they, they use their cycle racing team. I think it's quite amazing, Mappe, who into the industrial chemicals and uh, the, uh, into, they make special cements and special paints and so on, that they should be involved in sponsoring a racing team because it's isn't the sort of thing you can go on a shelf and pick off their having been encouraged by the brand on the bicyclist to, to buy it. But they'd use it as a platform to uh, get messages through to their, uh, their main customers, and that's what they did. Back out with Jan Ulrich. Well, you know enough about him, don't you? Second in the Tour de France in 1998. It's the first overall 97 when he surprised though he passed a junior world champion. And a very useful time trialist indeed.
and just one... I'll give you the story. It looks like we're setting with him. You didn't see it here, here early on. Only one kilo in the weight over his uh, Tour de France weight when he won the Tour. They scout him. Well, he'll be lucky to get inside the top 20 today. He's just got to... In fact, I think he said that um, providing he stays within three minutes of the victor, he'll be happy with that one. He started out today, Skartin, 54 seconds down on Alano, so he's lost nearly a minute so far. And I think what he's saying is that when he gets into that big climb that we've got on Sunday, that uh, he can pull back that sort of time on the climb. And with the mountain top finishes, we've got this cart in here coming through. He, he loves mountain top finishes. That's his speciality. And we've got uh, five arrivals at the summit. Five times the Tour of Spain is going to arrive up at the summit. So look at the time he's losing here on all and sundry. He knows up in the mountain he can just take back four, five, six minutes on many people. And uh, Ulrich, again, not perhaps the world's greatest mountain climber. He, he's got to get up there with the best of them. But on a time trial, this is where he can, uh, can stay in contention. Whereas uh, Escartim will really be struggling to stay within, I say, maybe two, three minutes of, uh, of Ulrich. He'd be happy with that. But uh, it might be even worse. We shall see. Back out with Vandenbroek. Just to refresh your memory, the fastest time he got so far, McRae, 56 minutes and 13 seconds. McRae, the fastest rider we got so far. So don't forget, if you want to guess the winner of this race, you can do it on email, you can telephone through as well. And I don't know exactly when we know when we close the voting, because it, I think it's going to be like Tour de France, we did it half past four, so we've got sort of another 15 minutes to go. You might have seen it up on your screen. At, uh, And uh, it looks like we could be uh, shutting the lines down at 4.30 to win lots of bags of goodies things from Eurosport. And uh, whereas people have already voted for Zula, have got it wrong because he's been now out, over distance out, overtaken because we've, we've had Maori do better than him. We've had McRae uh, do better as well. Uh, young McRae, as I say, just turned up to the MAPE team. He'd previously been riding with the Saturn squad. And in 1997, he won the core States Hamilton Classic. And in 1998, uh, stage in the Nidsack and Rundfire and a second in the the stage of the Milwaukee International. So he's really surprised a few people here. Young McRae by his performance, that's something, of, even looking back at his records, we wouldn't have expected to see. But we've got like to see this man, uh, Ulrich, go around here at a good rate of knots, and let's see what he's going to do at the intermediate time check to see if he can, uh, can topple the bold McRae. Amateur world champion in 1993. Then on that tremendous performance when he won the Tour de France in 97. He won a couple of stages then in, in the 19th state, uh, uh, Tour de France that year. Stage victory in the Tour de Suisse in 97, third place overall in that race too as well. Won the Hugh Classic uh, in 97, the Hamburg race. And of course second in the uh, Tour de France in 98. And this year, well, disappointment that he couldn't take part and really carrying a lot too much weight the year before. He should have gone a lot better, I think, but now I think he's getting the sort of training he needs from his people around about him. He's one of those riders, unfortunately, when it comes to the back end of the year, uh, uh, can always suddenly put on weight. There are natural athletes who, who, who can eat everything in sight and end up looking like uh, stick insects, but not this man. Give, give him a sight of a, a bratwurst and a nice glass of beer, and suddenly he, he puts on kilos.
again that gorgeous but I, went, I suppose these bikes can be museum pieces afterwards aren't they uh, so here comes uh, Brochard uh, Brochard coming to Salamanca to finish the stage today and well Brochard was this morning 3 minutes 31 seconds down on general classification and he was the the, the top man of what I call the also runs because he was in 24 spot this morning. From now on in, all the rides will be coming in are those that are within one minute and 23 seconds of Abra Milano, who's been the last man to go. And they're all the chaps, this man who started all yesterday on that uh, rampage, I think you'd call the word, when we went out on the stage yesterday, 160 kilometres, just completely blasted everybody into lots of little pieces. Well, he was the one who started it all, and he leads the rest of the pack, one might say, because he's three minutes, 33 sec 30, seconds down this morning. Elano, last man out on the road, world time trial champion, knows what it's like to ride against the watch, the flat territory here, and he's got the advantage of all the time checks coming in uh, down the road ahead of him to tell him how he's going against the various riders. McRae is the fastest time so far, 56 minutes and 13 seconds at the, uh, at the finish line for this course covering today 46.4 kilometres that's uh, the Salamanca Salamanca time trial that's the position at the moment Marin second spot Hamilton back into third uh, fourth is Casey fifth is Ekimov three American stars and stripes in the first four brilliant performance as far as they're concerned and quickly then going back again to Tour de Lavigne. I mentioned earlier in my programme we had the wonderful and amazing uh, case uh, just on stage seven two days ago when Floyd Landis, yes, he's American with a name like that, Floyd Landis uh, was the overall leader on general classification ahead of Le Boulanger, yes, he's French, you'd expect that, wouldn't you? And uh, Ludovic, yes, he's German, you'd expect that, wouldn't you? That was the first three with uh, McGree back in seven spot. And then uh, that was when the day when Christa Jenner of New Zealand won the stage with McGree of, uh, McGee of Australia in second spot and Botcherov of Russia into third. Just shows the international way in which the cyclists are coming through from the days in which the big uh, nations for France, Italy and Spain, uh, plus Belgium, and occasionally Holland uh, dominated cycle racing. So that's the Tour de l'Avenir. I thought I'd mention that too because how, how well the Americans are doing. But to yesterday, watch this Be uh, Benesto rider here, Kimenez. Not so good then. He would like to do better than this, I think. He's not the world's greatest time trialist, but he needs to keep himself pretty well in contention. And yesterday, the Benesto team who... Uh, were out there in all sorts of trouble when Zula got dropped, although they did manage to keep uh, some riders up in the top of the group, including Jimenez. Uh, they had consolation back in the Tour de l'Avenir because their man, uh, da uh, David Lataza, uh, Lat uh, sorry, Lataza of the Spanish Benesto team. Let's quickly get this one down for you. I'm going to write this one down. Jimenez, just a minute. But here he's going to be 35. 34.49, right, 34.49. Um, going back over to the Tour de Lavenir, yesterday Benesto romped away. Two of their riders, uh, La Tassa and Oza, of the, of the Benesto team, they went away. As uh, so you can see, the situation just being blown apart the seam. Alano is 22 seconds up on Ulrich. I thought Ulrich might go for this one, but uh, Alano and Ulrich there separated after 12.2 kilometers by 22 seconds. Alano, this is his speciality as a world time trial champion, and uh, he's going to make life difficult for the mountain climbers today. And look at the way he's spinning those gears around. He's not pushing too big a gear. Perhaps he probably isn't the big gear and hasn't got anywhere else to go, but he's flexing it quite well. Serrano coming in. Race time still there, 56.13.2. So the Ponce team and Benesto having their own little warfare yesterday, but um, over in the uh, Tour de l'Avenir, the great ride by Oza and, and Lataza. What happened yesterday, the Lataza got the stage victory, but Oza took over the classification general. So the uh, Benesto are first and second on the Tour de l'Avenir, now the, the, the sort of small, well, the, the junior French race of the Tour de France, with Landis, the American Ford Landis, back into third spot. So the Americans still showing their strength by maintaining a third spot back out there in France on the Tour de l'Avenir. I thought you'd like to know a bit about that, what's going on whilst watching this racing out here on the screen. So, uh, Casero, 32, that's that's a useful ride, he's going quicker, than, oh he's coming, quite not quite useful here, Casero, 27Ks and he's got it, 32.35 ahead of McRae now, but don't forget behind him uh, is the flying Ulrich and uh, the flying Alano 
riding in second from last and last on the road. And so the situation could be that Alano could well take this one, but still Casero leading at the 27 kilometer park ahead of McRae, who at the moment is still the overall leader at the finish line in uh, uh, Salamanca. Off for today, wearing the jersey of the overall race did up on this time trial, 46.4 kilometers. That's exactly 29 miles, by the way, the Salamanca-Salamanca circuit. There were some very twisty roads, uh, as you can see on your screen here. Some it nice uh, to begin with, good good, good roads, good wide roads. It jumps and dives and jumps around all over the place. And if you just imagine, and well, I just can tell you that it's, it's 29 miles in English money, and you realise that the fastest time we've got at the moment um, at the finish is McRae, the American uh, Chad McRae, for the Mappe Quick Step team, 56 minutes and 13 seconds. That's 20, that's just, well, exactly one hour would be 30 miles an hour, wouldn't it? Or 29 miles an hour. So, the fact he's done it 56 minutes shows that he's gone round here well over 30 miles an hour on these uh, little back roads. And at this particular point in the tour, of uh, Spain when the riders so far to date have covered 969 kilometres in all so we're well over the 500 mile mark around about 500 uh, well, getting up towards uh, uh, 560 570 miles I suppose we've done so far and imagine going around this race having been over those mountainous climbs yesterday at an average of 25 miles now in fact the overall race average is 40.7 kilometres per hour for the 969 uh, kilometres covered so far Ulrich here having got to that second spot uh, sorry uh, first spot in the sprint yesterday to take his uh, stage victory his first victory in just over 12 months uh, in second spot on ge general classification 10 seconds down on uh, uh, Olano and we understand that Olano is about 22 seconds on this particular road up on him so that means Olano has probably got a half minute on general classification ahead of Ulrich but there's some way to go in towards the finish and Ulrich stage victory yesterday I say surprise a lot of us by his performance and I think he will say thank you to uh, Boldinger his friend who took him off to that uh, motorcycle race when 150,000 people just a few weeks ago saw him and cheered him and then he decided he would get stuck in and perhaps he would ride the Tour of Spain because originally he didn't want to do it and he's come back through riding things like the uh, uh, the Tour of Holland he's ridden in that one he, he's been riding one or two other single day races but he's now really worked hard his weight now is only one kilo more than it was uh, when he was uh, riding in the Tour de France and he's got a lot of good morale too from the uh, they sort of started to get well soon from his compatriots, but he's had so much trouble with his, his knee. Uh, it's been affected his training, and now he's really got. If you have a chance, the cameras go around and see his face. He's all gone sallow suddenly. He can get rather podgy, can Jan Ulrich. And so uh, his team manager, really Pevenage, has said so far after he's being encouraged by Goodford to go and ride the thing that Ulrich will have to wait and see how he's going by the time he gets after Sunday stage in the mountains. But they still think he will look for stage victories at the moment. Para from. Vitalis Seguras on his way through, a very famous name. We were actually trying to find out whether he was in relation to the other great para, the great mountain climber of some years ago who demolished everybody when we went up a bit from Colombia. But uh, that has not so far been resolved. We'll try and find out for you. Very familiar name, I suppose, in, uh, in Colombia. Back out then. On all our latest starters are here. This is Ig you know, Cuesta. the thing if you're going through a bad patch you could tell your team and you better stick that megaphone because the way in which it's uh, upsetting your your rhythm maybe Right, so I was settling down here. More news about Shudo Grady, by the way. He's, um, he's still in hospital. You may remember that he got mugged, uh, what's it, a week ago today, I think it was, or a week ago tonight, when uh, coming out of that restaurant, the, they got set upon himself, Feucht and David Miller, and they, they tried to, and I don't know, they did have a go at taking the gold chain from around uh, Stuart's head, and they, they thumped him over the head. And uh, he's got a double fracture and some still some blood clots there, so they're not letting him out, which is a very nasty thing indeed. I think about six... Uh, stitches in his head too so get well soon Stuart good on you boy we'll see you back in the tour down under when you've got rid of the headache let's hope it's done very quickly the his team the great agricole have recruited two more riders uh, Modlin's joined from La France de Jure and Gujo from Casino making it a nice mixture of different nationalities There's so many English speaking riders on that uh, team now that I even in talking to Roger Jay he's speaking jolly good English and sometimes we've been asked questions in French he starts replying in English but uh, that team 
with Chris Borman et al. Looking forward to next year, I'm sure. And Stuart O'Grady starting the season off in January. And we wish you a good recovery, Stuart, from the thumping you've got. I believe they've got the culprits who set about uh, uh, Voigt, O'Grady and Miller. And I hope they lock them up for a long time and throw away the key. Back out with Ulrich. Well, Ulrich beaten in the big mountains by Pantani in the tour in 1998. Uh, having took a long time to get back into form. He had a gutsy fight there to do it. Pantani, by the way, you see the, what, 25 Ks to go for, um, for, for Alano here. Um, Pantani, who has not really raced since the uh, Tour of Italy, is still suffering with, the, with his knee problems. And uh, they've got uh, hyperpression. Um, and they're saying that he's got to stop. He went to see the doctor, a fellow called uh, Talagnoli, who was a fellow looked after him when he had that nasty accident in Milan in 1995. Oops, there you go. And uh, Pantani's had this, 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 this problem. They, they gave him some special tests and they've come to the conclusion that he can't go and ride his bike again for, for some time. He said he needs rest, rest and more rest. And, uh, and so at least another two or three days, he's just going to have rest and then they're going to check it again for him. So it could be that we won't see Pantani back in action, but uh, he, he doesn't want to just end the season doing nothing, having uh, stopped on the tour of Italy when they found his blood count was over the 50% level. He wanted a race. He's very bad if he goes into the winter without having raced and he's desperately keen to get back. But it looks like he's trying to get back too soon with that knee trouble. And the, the specialist doctor who repaired his legs after that terrible crash has said to him, he must rest, rest, rest. So keep our fingers crossed for Pantani. Blanco just finishing. I don't think again that Pantani is likely. The, the World Championships on the road, the big pro one, is on the 10th of October. And that's going to be, what, about a month from now, isn't it? So he's got a hell of a job to do, A, to get himself back in reasonable form, but B, to get himself selected by the, the Italian squad because uh, uh, they won't like to select a man who's probably a little bit under-raced. Van der Broek rolling on quite a big gear, lying eighth, ninth there. Well, there's a lot of faster men still behind Van der Broek. And I think he's uh, very pleased to get this far. Van den Broek is lying fifth over on general classification, 29 seconds down on Alano. And we started out this morning, so he will certainly lose a bit more time today on Alano, but he could still be up there in the uh, in the top half dozen place at the end of it all. Well, this is the man who started the whole of the Tour of Spain off in fine form, Igor González Galdiano. Uh, he was the chap who took the prologue time trial on the Saturday, just a week uh, this... Well, look at tomorrow. Uh, that was a week back from tomorrow when he took over the jersey. And we all thought, well, that was a flash in the pan, but he's been able to stay there. He stayed with the breakaway group yesterday that came in, those 23 riders, um, ahead of the rest of the riders at uh, 3 minutes and uh, 13 seconds. So he managed to survive that one, as did this man here, Jan Ulrich, riding on his own because the telecom team hadn't got anybody else in that main group at the front, so he watched the lads you see here in the yellow and black for the Onse Deutsche Bank team, ripping the legs off the Benesto team who got Zula marooned three and a half minutes behind. In fact, it got worse than that as we got further on in towards the finish. So, in reality, uh, Ulrich benefited, by the way, in which the Onse team sorted things out and Cuesta here, looking at quite a useful little ride here for Cuesta. Winner of the Tour of the Bay Vasco. Last year. And he was, was gifted that one by Jalabert because uh, he'd been working so hard over the years, this man, for the top riders. But he's now showing his, when he can go against the watch without having to do the fetching and carrying and shielding of his top men, he can go quite well. He's like second then at that particular point. Beltran. No, you wouldn't expect him to do too much here. But even though you say, well, look at that, 59. Remember, this is 29 miles, by the way. So uh, even when he comes in here, he's done just on 29 miles an hour uh, to come into the, well, just inside the top 60. And the average speed, 46.8. So he's just done on 30 miles an hour. And it looks like he's now like to be caught on the way in. And Jerez, yes, going that bit quicker. So 57.40 for Jerez. Back out with Ulrich, back out again too quickly with our 
camera's changing. This is the man Igor Gonzalez Galdiano. Just if you're wondering what the sort of time we're running at now, Palace just finished, and uh, so they're taking around about 50 odd minutes to get round this course. 56 minutes for McRae. So we're going to be so about 55 minutes, 60. Yeah, we should be seeing. Um, the finish of Alano, probably about five o'clock, give or take a minute. So, the tap you got on your screen now, we've probably got then, if you're back in Great Britain, it's four o'clock as far as you're concerned, but about f five o'clock here. This is uh, the team manager, Mano Saiz. All the time checks coming in, and he's now ready to go out. He said, These team managers, they, they not only do the instructions, they also drive the car as well. Normally, there's just one more chap in the car, the uh, uh, the mechanic with the spare wheels, but they usually on occasion like this you might find one or two of the VIPs or one of the VIPs from the uh, the sponsor coming along and jumping in. So Ulrich here and Galdiano, the best time so far, 32-34 to beat at this point. And can Ulrich do it? They are going quicker and quicker. Yes, he's, uh, this time I think he's going to get faster as we go on. He's got the strength, he's got the determination, and he's got the skill to a time trying at this level. There he is, yeah, 31.53. Look at that, knocked 40 seconds out of Galliano. So, looking back down the time scale. This morning on the general classification, Ulrich 10 seconds back on Alano. Gonzalez Galdiano, the eager one, was 15 seconds back. So you can see that uh, already now he's shopped a lot more time between himself and Galdiano. Brilliant. Well, at the moment, this chap on your screen uh, started two minutes after. Uh, Rick has been setting the fastest time. He got 31.53 to beat, has uh, Alano. And it looks like he's going to continue to hold that lead. Really powering along. Oops, did he lose the bottle? Oh, that might be a disappointment for him. Great phalanx of motorcycles around here. They'll have to move that one forward. 31.53 is Ulrich's time. I guess that motorcycle a bit too close for him for comfort. And uh, I think the, the officials won't want that. that confirmation came up to the gap because the, the thing kept on flicking there. He's certainly in the lead and uh, by 32 seconds. So the whole board's changed now except for Ulrich. It's becoming a Spanish benefit before we found what four of the flags in the top five were American. Now it's just changing as the back men come through and well Escartin we wouldn't expect this Garten to, uh, say, do anything tremendous here, but he's got, he's, he really has got to stay. He said within about three or no more than four minutes of the winner of the time trial today. And if they're going to get round through here in about 55 minutes, then he's on to three and a bit minutes now already. So this will be one worth jotting down. So we know the distance is back to his Garten from when Alano and Ulrich finish. He's just about done. I think he, he could just about still be inside four minutes down on, on the winner of the, sta of the time trial stage there, which he, he, he said he'd be happy with that one. Because that's the sort of time he's got to pull back when we get up in the mountains. And yes, he can do it, but he's given it all he's got, and he's gone across the line then. It's Garten in 58 minutes and 51 seconds. So he still could be there about four minutes down on the winner of the stage today.
Well, with about 15 minutes to go, or just under that for Jan Ulrich then on this uh, time trial stage. He's being hotly pursued, two minutes back by uh, Abra Milano. And as they went through the time check after 27 kilometers had been covered uh, through there, there was 32 seconds gap between them in uh, to the advantage of, uh, of Alano. But it's a good old haul back in towards the finish, and I think somehow that this man is likely to ride, uh, uh, probably holding the same speed. Might even begin to pull it back a bit. He's got a good ability to come good towards the end. Although psychologically, for Alano to be on the road following after this man. Uh, then he can certainly be able to get the time checks coming in and find out exactly what's going on. We're up then with uh, Igor uh, Gonzalez Galdiano, who have been slotting into about the third fastest, but uh, you might find it difficult to hang on to this the way things are going. But he's a nice little smooth uh, pedalling style, not pushing too big a gears. And uh, I'm just wondering if we're seeing perhaps a slight change in the way in which people shove gears because time trialers in Great Britain are putting on the bigger and bigger gears they can and laboriously push them round. And I was very interested to see this show how. As you can see, now, this is before the other chaps come through by the 46.4 that uh, neither Ulrich nor um, uh, Alano have actually got this particular point. Apparently on quite a smallish gear that uh, there seems to be a, a change of thought here and certainly uh, Armstrong geared down a lot this year when we were up in the mountains. It didn't seem to be pushing such big gears. We went through a period when everybody was pushing on the biggest possible gear they could do and hammering away and uh, getting some. They are doing quite good performances but I often wonder later on how much uh, effort it takes to do it and how much long term damage it does to you. In other words, you might be able to do one or two decent rides, and my mind goes to Onchar, for instance, who's a super, super time trial, who pushes the big, 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 unbelievable big gears, and one just wonders if that affects the, the overall season when you're riding your guts out in one or two of the time trials, pushing gears the size of windmills. That's Casero rocking away here. Back around the town where the big crowd is beginning to gather, those people around the course on the early part of heading back in now to see if the Spanish favourite Olano can get here. It's a lovely uh, university town, you can probably see in the background, there's a lovely golden stone as, some, as our cameras go up, they pick up the narrow streets and uh, some lovely buildings too as well. And on the outskirts here, Olano coming in, urged on again, really going a great rate of knots. Well, this is only going to be the early skirmish in this uh, Tour of Spain this year because we've got some mountainous stuff ahead of us before we get to the, the, to the penultimate time trial as well. Or the, the time trial on the penultimate stage. But this uh, really, for Alano, a chance to go into tomorrow's stage wearing the gold jersey. No mountains tomorrow, can be well controlled and uh, the situation I think will level itself off ready for our uh, uh, fling on uh, Sunday when we hit the mountains. So the, the battle which raged yesterday just south of here, very much like the one when the French war, uh, during the War of Independence, when the French occupied Salamanca and later on Wellington came in here in 1812, blasted his way through and then went on down to the Alipilis Valley just south of here on the 22nd of July where he had the victory of Salamanca and that was the major turning point in that war. Well, we had a turning point yesterday, didn't we, when those 23 riders went away and gained a lead of three minutes on many riders, including Mr Azula, who was back at what five minutes 29 seconds by the end of the stage yesterday and this rider here uh, Jan Ulrich did a tremendous ride to stay in contention to win the stage and to show people he's back with a bang and we had uh, the fourth consecutive uh, victory by a German in the tour this year Marcel Wurst having taken the uh, three stages before that in his, in his beautiful sprint finish that he has that gift that he's got then Ulrich taking the uh, the sprint from a pack of 23 riders after that mountain stage yesterday giving it the fourth consecutive German victory in the this year's Tour of Spain. The Spanish champion coming up very quickly indeed. Casero do it, finished them behind him. Will be Leseca, Para, Rebellin, Vandenbroek, Cuesta, Gonzalez, Galliano, Ulrich and Arlano getting into the last uh, 20 minutes of this race. Casero, the time to beat, 56-13. Well, he's already gone up in the interim time check down the road there to challenge for that, and he's done it then. 55-49 puts him in the lead, but I wonder for how long. So still waiting with bating breath on the side of the road is uh, McRae. 
Let's take what happens from now on in. That certainly is going to be a name to be conjured with. I'm sure the Mape Quickstep people will have been pleased with uh, McRae's uh, sterling performance, which surprised, I think, a lot of people. Anyway, so he's now in second spot uh, with uh, Hamilton, his team, uh, his countryman, and uh, Casey down there riding for the US Postal Team, Hamilton and Casey, whereas McRae up there in second spot. Now 24 seconds down, 54. Uh, that's a good ride then by... Casero. Now, see, I found Casero is down there. He's down in four spots, you see, because he's the, he's the last three riders on the road, and they're actually running in that order. Uh, Igor Gonzalez Galdiano is just uh, two minutes on the road ahead of Ulrich, who's two minutes on the head of Alano. So, as this is changing there, that's the situation. In fact, Ulrich dropped back if he dropped by some 43 seconds back. So, uh, I think that I, I've got the impression that probably coming in, Ulrich will start to regain some ground, but it isn't working out that way. It's Alano, the world time trial champion, who's doing uh, what he knows best, that's cleaving his way through, and it looks like he could uh, run out victory by maybe up to a minute if he keeps this going. Well, another revelation of the race, Igor Gonzalez Galdiano, a little uh, chip down there going round, so part to do with our global satellite system and the and recording when they go across the line. I've been asked all sorts of technical questions and I tried to uh, get them in the early part of the programme. I'll just go on here from Ian Smith uh, from Cardiff who passed a message through Eurosport's office in London saying that I said something on air about Derny racing, about mopeds, and his son's very interested. He gave me some information on air today. can't remember exactly what it was all about, but um, Derny racing is a, a system they have on the track in the six days and they have one little motor in front of a rider and they race round, usually about 10 riders, 10 11 riders on the track and they have their own little race in about 15 minutes. There are also some Derny Championships uh, of Europe too when the riders go around for maybe like one hour. And the Derny... Uh, somebody asked me some time ago, where does Derny come from? It's D-E-R-N-Y, Derny. Uh, and they call it uh, uh, Boudin uh, in, in French. And I think Boudin, when I came to look at it, was something to do with the buzzing bee uh, of translation. So that may be because they buzz around, they call them Boudins. But I, I think it was also to do with the man's name who uh, invented the Derny. They're mopeds. 50cc mopeds with enormous great deep chain ring and they use them for uh, pacing on the track and also a lot of riders use that sort of moped thing or scooters for uh, for, for, for training behind the uh, out on the road behind maybe it, the brother or the coach or sometimes even even the wife or girlfriend goes out on a little moped and off you go suck it stuck in behind to, to get the miles up eight commits to go for this man uh, but it might have been though something to about, about uh, the racing i was talking about was the Motor pace racing, I may use the word journey, motor pace racing, which is at Hearn Hill, and it's going to be, I think it's tomorrow week, check it in Cycling Press uh, at Hearn Hill, and my good friend and often co commentator of Eurosport, Russell Williams, will be riding there in the national championships. But they're big motors, they're not little motors, they're great big ones. They're about, if I remember correctly, instead of 1,000 cc, they may be a bit less than that, but they also have a great big belt drive on them. So these chaps go around the track and they stand almost over the back wheel in upright position, and the, the chaps get behind it with a bike with a, a small front wheel not like you see here the fr front wheel is about the same size but they turn the forks round the other way so that the rider gets right up behind the motor it's a single speed single fixed gear and get right in behind the big motors and it's very noisy and it lasts about I don't know, about an hour and something uh, and russell's going to take part in that one and the other chaps out there going for the british championship on the same day that uh, russell williams as his coach at hern hill is going to arrange a what he calls the eurosport commentators mini race that's for kids under 12 he's got about 25 and turning up and eurosport have kindly donated some special goodies for um, Russell to give to the kids at the end of it all as prizes. He's also got some prizes himself from uh, other sponsors, including people like uh, uh, Bromley Video, uh, popped up with a, one, a, a video, I think I've given two, one of Kelly and one of Roche, because they're also commentators on Eurosport from time to time. So that's going to be, I think, a Saturday week at Hernhill, and uh, that'll be there. And let's hope the sun shines like today, as we're now watching uh, the riders coming in. I think this is... Uh, Galliano, oh, so it's Para yet to come. And after Para, there'll be Rebellin, then Vandenbroek, then Cuesta, and then the last three who are battling out for the top three places as they are overall in general classification when we came into stage today. We've mentioned the way in which the on saying uh, Benesto team are continually battling with each other, but the, this new team on the block, they've already been running for two years, I think it's their third year now, Vitalicia Segura's team. I think they'll be poised likewise to take advantage of uh, uh, of anybody's indiscretion in those other teams, because this young lad's rid himself into a frazzle as well. And 
Ulrich looks like he's just losing a little bit of the edge. He, he seemed much stronger further down the road on this very unusual, what he calls a museum piece now, because the UCI say you can't ride that next year, it's banned. It's got curved tube and small front wheels, and that's naughty, that's what they say, so that's out. I suppose you could always put a bid in for it. Can I buy Mr. Ulrich's bike and hang it up on the wall? I suppose they must put him in a museum somewhere and say this is where everything stopped. 1999 by the UCI. Good job they didn't stop it with a big front wheel, a little back wheel, wasn't it? Well, Ulrich, yesterday's victory, first one for 12 months, and now he's not going to get the time trial here, but he's certainly going to keep himself in contention for the overall honours. And that was... Uh, Leseka from the Escatello SKD team finished. I don't think we're too worried about, about his time because he's been caught for two minutes by for over two minutes by Para. I'm going to use a little climb up. And uh, I think time trying again showing not one of his best uh, best ways of going about. Cresta onto Deutsche Bank. Getting encouragement from behind. Well his great job is going to be looking after Alano from now on in. He was actually fifth in the Spanish time trial championships in, way back in 1994. And he's, he wouldn't look upon himself as being the greatest time trial, but he can get round at a reasonable rate of knots, obviously. In the Simon Catalana in 96, he was, uh, he was fifth there in the time trial stage as well. And yeah, look at 1998. Uh, no, he didn't get anything in that time trial session then. So he's he only got, he was, yes, over the top half dozen seems to be about his, his ability when it comes to time trial for, for uh, Lopez de Castro Cuesta. We're now back out again with the young lad from Vitalis Seguros, ex gold jersey on day one after the time trial. Back out then with Alano. He certainly got his season well and truly organised, hasn't he? I think he had a pretty disappointing Tour de France. He finished sixth overall. I think he was hoping to do better than that. And uh, in the time trial on the what the stage at the back end, 19th, he was what in he uh, was sixth in that time trial at Futuroscope. And in the time trial we had uh, on uh, stage eight, he was fourth in that one. So he was not going on firing all cylinders when he was in the time trial in the Tour de France. They had a. Um, a fourth and a sixth place when he went to finish sixth overall in the Tour de France this year and past winner of this race last year he's that's why he's got number one on his back and he's warmed up quite well for this race because uh, he won the Tour of Burgos and uh, he won the open time trial stage on that one and once he got in the lead that was it he just held on to the thing all the way through even when they went over the mountains and Frigo Psycho was his second spot. Frigo's retired for the race, and Dufo, who was third in the Tour of Burgos, has also retired from this race too. And the uh, so he's just shown he's coming up into good form. Alano ready for this Tour of Spain, but then the big mountains ahead could, I think, give us uh, something else to talk about. Rebellion coming in to finish now. So he's won, stayed the Tour of Spain in '98, kept the jersey there. Uh, 97 won the Grand Prix Swiss and the San Sebastian Classic 2. He's won the pink, won the pink jersey in the Tour of Italy as well, but uh, on this occasion he's dropped down a bit on the time trial. He's going to have to use his great, great climbing skills if he's going to find himself in the top three places in Madrid in two weeks' time. Well, back out with Cuesta on his way through towards the finish in uh, Salamanca. Not been showing up in the top uh, three or four places, but just having to soldier on around this course while the battle rages behind him. When he's finished, well, in fact, we should be seeing uh, Van den Broek coming to finish next before we then go back down to pick up the last three riders. He's got one coming to go. And the Spanish recognising the colours, they're chewing anything but it's going on two wheels around here. Lovely day, 28 degrees, uh, the most on before. It's now getting even hotter than that to over the 30. We had a hot day in Saturday yesterday. We had some pretty good weather except for that little bit of rain that came down. And we had that funny storm, didn't we, that we was about that on day two or day three when it suddenly squirled and the rain came out of the sky by the bucket load. Everybody splashed through. Van der Broek coming in to finish now. Um, winner of such things as the Paris Brussels in the past, winner of the Paris Nice, winner of the Gent Babogum. So he's got a lot of single-day classics under his belt. Not the world's greatest uh, rider when it comes to riding over the, the long tours, but there we are, 
not a good time to have from his point of view. I think what he might be looking for, Van den Broek, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him trying to go for a stage break. Not perhaps tomorrow. I would. I think he's got his eye on a stage break. He survived yesterday over those mountains, did Van den Broek, and just shows he's got the talent to, to climb when the, it matters. But uh, I wonder how he cope with the five mountain top climbs we've got, which are really going to test the ability of the all-round cyclist like Van den Broek, but special mountain goats. And his chap Coetta can climb quite well, but his job will be to hold back and stay with Alano and minimise his losses against people like uh, Escartin uh, and Geras when we get up into the big climbs which uh, lie ahead. Does that <laughs> enormous flotilla, isn't it? That's the present position at the moment. Casero 55-49 in the lead. McRae second, Maori third. Maori quite an early pace setup that uh, is now being pushed down a bit in the baking hot conditions. The later starters cooking a bit more. Well, this is the man who, on general classification, going in uh, to the start today, was lying third overall, 15 seconds back on Alano. Ulrich was 10, 10 seconds back, sorry, in second spot. So uh, the way he's been going so far, uh, Igor Gonzalez, uh, Galliano, the way he's going, I'm pretty sure he'll stay in that uh, third spot. So that's going to be good news for his uh, team and they'll be poised to take advantage of the other big teams if they just miss out on it. His brother's already finished, but this is a good ride then by young Igor. Comes from uh, Vittoria Gassets, that's where the big BH bicycle factory uh, company is. And he goes across the line then, the 26-year-old, well, he's not quite 26 yet, he's only 25 at the moment, but I think we're going to see a lot from this young, talented ride in the past. Uh, he's finished the Tour of Spain in the past, but not been as going as well he has done today. And Ulrich coming through, we've seen Gonzalez Galliano finish, and Ulrich has come through very quickly. He's nearly caught him for two minutes. Ulrich's ride here, extremely good one indeed. And there, Casero's the best time, 55-49 up on the screen. What's Ulrich going to do? He could take the lead. In fact, I think he's going to, but behind him, as he goes, 54-29. Look at that. A whole one minute, 19 seconds faster, but right behind him, this is the man powering along here, who last time check we had was uh, some 40 odd seconds up on uh, on Ulrich, and so it looks like he's going to uh, triumphantly come in to the finish here to keep that gold jersey on his shoulder. But there's some rough, rough, rough stuff ahead of him. The big flotilla behind. The man in the gold jersey, Adam Alana, world time trial champion, came into this race in superb form. Winner last year of the Tour of Spain, no doubt about it. And look what a task, splashing time he's got. It's coming, what, perhaps nearly a, a minute up on Ulrich. 57.7 seconds, in fact, with a time of 53 minutes and 32 seconds. Well, 53.32, just think back to what I said earlier in the programme. This distance they're doing today, 46.4 kilometres, that is, in fact, a distance of 29 uh, miles round here, and he's just gone round in 53 and a bit minutes for 29 miles. Tremendous performance, and uh, there he's 57 up on uh, Ulrich. Casero managed to stay into third place, Galliano at 2 minutes and 18 seconds. But on back down, those early rides by Mari, Hamilton and Casey all going well. Hamilton, winner of the Tour of Denmark, also a chap I think in the mountains might be doing quite well. We're seeing a little bit of a shifting here. The overall general classification will certainly show that this man is still in the lead on the overall classification, having won the time trial this stage six of the Tour of Spain. But uh, menacingly behind him, having lost just about one minute uh, in that uh, time trial, Ulrich, but uh, still the big mountain climbers. And we can't ignore people like Igor Gonzalez Galdiano, nor uh, Mr. Escartin either. Well, a quick look back then at uh, 
the performance of Alana. I'm doing a sum here to see Escartian finish in 58 minutes and 51 seconds. So there was, in fact, about five minutes and um, what's that going to be? Another 20 seconds between them. At, this, at the end of the time trial today. So Lano now has pumped 5 minutes 20 seconds out of Escartin. He did start out with a, a, another 54 seconds up on Escartin, so Escartin now is probably about 6 minutes 15 seconds adrift of uh, Alano on the general classification. I'm just looking back at some of the specialist climbers who could be threatening. Jerez uh, was only about a minute slower than uh, his teammate uh, Escartin, so the Kelme team are poised, but they're now the thick end of uh, well, five and a half, six minutes back on uh, uh, Alano, who's got a very strong team round about him. So, and rea as reality also, we not forget either that, um, uh, as you looked at the overall general classification, uh, Galliano poised there to, to make life difficult for, for Ulrich. The gaps are there, but the, the best team, the best climbers are a bit further down. Now, Cuesta won't do uh, there, three minutes, 17 seconds. He won't attack Al Alano at all. Ulrich's virtually, I won't say on his own, but so we come down here to, to Jerez, of that little group there, Para Reasonable. Well, Tonka's not the world's greatest climber when it comes to really nasty stuff, nor is, is uh, Van der Voorbe or Van der Broek. Hellas is, he's five minutes, seven seconds down. We're not going down any further, I don't think, but um, about another minute back was his teammate Escartim. So the uh, the battle will rage, not tomorrow, because it's going to be flat, but when we come on uh, for that stage on Saturday, where many things might, might change yet again. So I think probably the, the top climbers will be disappointed that they didn't do a better time trial today, and the first skirmish on Saturday might give a chance to try and pull back a bit of time on Esca uh, on uh, Alano. But the man who's probably going to have to really watch out for it is Ulrich. He's got Guarini with him, winner of the, the, the Tour of uh, front stage into the Alpe d'Huez. But uh, I think, as we saw yesterday, that none of the rest of the telecom team managed to stay with uh, uh, with Ulrich. So Ulrich's going to have to just follow in the wheels and watch while the, the Vitalis Seguros, the... Uh, uh, the Anse team and Bernesto start to rip each other to pieces and just follow the wheels and hope he can get pull back some of that time on uh, Alano. So we've got a very interesting second and third week coming up on the Tour of Spain for this. And some gorgeous, glorious countryside tour. So these lovely sandstone uh, buildings in uh, Salamanca, those lovely narrow little streets too. Quick look down at the uh, the Catedral uh, Nuova, constructed in, uh, started in, nine, in 1513, by the way, and then completed it in 1560. A lot of different styles there, Gothic, Renaissance and Baroque style as well. You can have a nice look at it. The great big four wide bays on the west front. Just imagine those years gone by. I've always admired these old cartoons. Imagine those years gone by, over four, nearly 500 years ago, going up there on wooden scaffolding, hauling up lumps of stone, having been handcrafted by the stonemasons, way out in the quarries, brought miles and miles and miles by, uh, by horse and cart, and then hauled up onto the top, and all the work that goes on. And actually, not only actually making it, but do you imagine the, the artists who design buildings like this, as we go back again to the, the overall general classification? I, I just... I love it when you're walking around town. So one thing I do, by the way, which I suggest to you if you go into a town like this or when you're on holiday anywhere, look up. Many people maybe just look in the shop windows or look at the buildings up maybe no one 10, 12 feet above them. But the often thing to do is to look up because in big towns often the, the shops have taken over premises and above them are some really lovely old buildings. And uh, all right, you can't get views like we get off the helicopter here, but it is a thing to do is to look up. But also when you're in the towns like this, do go inside the cathedral. Do go inside the churches. Don't just go walking past the outside because when you get inside in the coolness and you can, you can sense the atmosphere of the, the great big cathedrals and you look round at the wonderful carvings it, it's something you have to do you don't just rush off down to the beach or just go out to the nearest cafe go inside some of these buildings not just museums but churches too well there we are that's your result on the screen of the overall classification and amazing way in which the Spanish dominate this race suddenly with only Ulrich uh, st stopping a clean sweep and the Anse and Vitali Seguros teams there must be rather pleased with their day's outing but further back down that uh, Benesto and uh, Kelmo Costa Blanca waiting for things to change well keep your fingers crossed for Tomkov uh, past winner of the Tour of uh, Italy that's always been a mountainous race too so we can't discredit him back in seventh spot although he's four minutes 42 seconds down uh, 
You see, I don't be, want to discredit Alano's performance, but I've seen him crack so many times. Uh, he just has a bad day. And if he has a bad day when the, they aren't all firing on all cylinders, then he won't lose so much time. But this race is not over by any means as we're heading out from here on the flat stage uh, tomorrow to go away from this, this gorgeous part of the world. So I, I love this Tour of Spain. I, I love the Tour of Italy. Too. I love all the big tours. Apart from the, the touring eating round, the nice restaurant. By the way, the sort of speciality here is the is the tail of the bull. It's oxtail. My father used to love oxtail, and uh, that's one of the, the local specialities here. So how many bulls you have to kill, kill to keep the West restaurants going? But they were. And this was say over the years been a tremendous centre of activity, and there we are looking down into the bull ring. I talk of the bull ring right on on the. I'm cool, there it is, because around the outside, those those ranches and fields in the back, that's where the black fighting bulls graze uh, out there today, but battling against the time, battling against the watch. And this was the man who came romping in, doing what he could do. Most of all, that's uh, press hard on the pedals, thunder through, and to record that tremendous time over the 46.4 km, 29 miles it was. That's the chap, by the way, on the intermediate sprints, the Meta Volantes, uh, uh, who went away the other day, Nieto, they were up to get the points in that competition. Jackie Duran, now this is what we could see tomorrow, by the way. Nieto and Duran will, will, re will recommence battles tomorrow because uh, we have three special sprints on the way through. Garcia Calvo, another of the lone breakaways, went off with Duran a few days back. Now, all that lot, we haven't seen today, have we? They entertained us for the first uh, few uh, days of the tour. They disappeared yesterday when, when the onslaught happened, and that was the King of the Mountains competition where Brochard uh, managed to take the jersey off his teammate, Hervé, who's back in third spot. Young Shallow is uh, another useful little climber up there in second spot. That will certainly change on, uh, on, on, on Sunday because the Sunday's climbing we've got, when we got the Alto uh, de la Gru, and that's an enormous climb, and we go over the top there, and it's 1,570 metres above sea level, but it's not just so much the, the, the climbing that this man's got to do, it is the steepness of the, of the climb, which has got everybody holding bated breath, and it goes actually up some 13.5 uh, kilometres, so, in fact, oh no, this is the... Uh, the sprint jersey, isn't most I still looked up some sort of whitish coloured jersey, but in fact it goes to the man who's leading on the points competition. It's very difficult to, 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 to differentiate between some of the jerseys. That the bright one is the King of the Mountain. This sort of off grey one is the one for the sprints competition, and that's Marcel Fust, hat trick winner of three stages back to back. And the chap on the left hand side looks like he's had too much new bread. Back to the Toddles. Fust, they are on the sprints competition. Well, again, didn't see much of him today, but Alano having. Uh, done well yesterday by finishing second spot just moving up there into second position and again Vus will have to be careful because we've got tomorrow will be okay I think Vus might win the stage tomorrow get himself some more points but then we move back up into the mountains life's going to be a bit difficult for uh, for people like Vus but the other thing about this race too we do get as we look back at the uh, the, the, the team prize we do get different days uh, of climbing mixed up with the flat days. We haven't got a sort of laborious one and we don't have to sort of wait a long time at the mountains. We have about two days on the on the flat, then one day in the mountain, one day on the flat, and two days in the mountain, and so it goes on. So we, we've got some very interesting uh, mountains on the, uh, the roads ahead of us with certainly five mountain top finishes to sort things out. But tomorrow is going to be a fairly flat stage uh, and that's just the confirmation of the results which you've been seeing so far on your screen. back down the list there and that's why we waited we popped that up for you so we could get on with the that's the, the stage success by the way does not hardly bother does he it's gone around there at about I, don't know, I suppose about roughly I'd, I'd guess about 32 miles an hour and so that's his, his stage victory and then of course he'll take over the, the gold jersey too the world time trial champion Cork any minute. That was too early. We can't. I think it was in a motor racing at Formula One where I saw the chaps actually couldn't do it this way, so they got all the bottling, banged it on the floor, and the force of the bang made the cork fly out the top. It seemed a bit of a waste, doesn't it? So opening up. Oh, that's nice, thank you. Yeah. Keep some for later, keep some for later. 
Just we, we commentated. Get an awful thirst, you know. Well, this is his territory. This is where he was able to punch some more time out of the mountain climbers, particularly say well over five minutes he, he smashed out of, uh, uh, of Escartim. And so Escartim, when we come to that to climb on the south, I keep mentioning, don't I? But, but it is 13 kilometres, of which the, it's a 22% at one point. And those who know a bit about gearing, in the article which was in La Marca, the, the Spanish newspapers took him out there and Escartin had to climb, he reckoned, uh, he, we've tried 41.26 and then they reckon he's probably going to have to go down to a 28 to a three rear, rear sprocket, maybe 39.28, so the big climbs will put this man under a lot of pressure, not tomorrow though, uh, it could be okay, but uh, there's still a lot of great racing ahead of us and some of the most clowny act action of our uh, mascots on the left-hand side, I've said, haven't heard me before, I've said I run a competition for the most unusual oddball mascots in any sporting award, perhaps we ought to have it at the end of the year, perhaps I can find some magazine who are prepared to have photographs of them. We can all vote on that, can't we? Anyway, those who took part in our competition today to say who's going to be the winner, I think the, those who know will have put this man down, and if so, you've won whatever you've got. Nice and good is. But thanks for joining us today on that competition. And to the winner, not only of the state, but also now taking over the gold jersey for yet another day. He got it yesterday, and he's now got a convincing lead over Mr Ulrich and uh, Galliano and uh, the rest of them, Casero et al. So tomorrow he could be under pressure. Looking back then at the, I'd say slow motion, it's a fixed frame of uh, Milano and the hubbub activity. One thing about uh, the stay we've had, been able to stay in Salamanca, this delightful town, still vibrating by the Spanish success that's got them at the moment in that uh, top uh, five places, no less than four Spanish riders. And on the stage in tomorrow, well, I'm pretty sure we might find Mr. Bush trying to go and get another stage victory. So that we're very happy for the, the Germans and for the Festino Lotus team as well. Well, after this, we're going to uh, give you the sports centre. Don't forget, to, throughout the evening, you'll be able to keep up with what's happening internationally on cycle as racing on football et al in our sports centre. Uh, your sports uh, centre presenter will be Gareth Evans for Eurosport International after this uh, programme. And for British Eurosport, it's uh, Sasha Upton. I'm David Duffield. Thanks for your company today. I look forward to you being with me tomorrow, and particularly on Sunday when it can be a real great day. Bye-bye. American Mappe quick step rider Fred Rodriguez won the sprint finish in Port Hope to take the 184 kilometer seventh stage of the Trans Canada race. He beat off the challenge of local rider Flash Gordon Fraser and Australian David McKenzie. It was Rodriguez's first win on Canadian soil. I played it smart and we waited till the last minute. My guys got me to, to, the, to, the, to the last couple of kilometers and then I just played off the other teams and it was a perfect lead out and I came around at about 150 meters. With three stages to go, the leader's red jersey is still worn by Jean-Cyril Robin of the Française des Jeux team.